Today, I'm speaking with Jan Leiker. Since 2021, Jan has been head of alignment at OpenAI, and along with OpenAI founder Ilya Satskova, he is going to be co-leading their new super alignment project. Years ago, Jan did his PhD with the well-known machine learning figure Marcus Hutter as supervisor, and he then did a brief postdoc at the Future of Humanity Institute at Oxford before becoming a research scientist at DeepMind, which is what he was doing when he last came on the show in 2018 for episode number 23, how to actually become an AI alignment researcher, according to Jan Leiker. Thanks for coming back on the podcast, Jan. Thanks a lot for having me again. It's really great to be here. Uh, you've, uh, yeah, you've uh, really, really gone places since then. I feel like we've been sometimes, sometimes pretty good at picking talent <laughs> or picking people whose careers are going to take off. Um, I hope to talk about the Super Alignment Project and who you're trying to hire for that, as well as put a lot of audience questions to you. So, so, so let's dive right in. To, to save you a little bit of effort, though, I'll, I'll read an extract from the announcement that OpenAI put out about the Super Alignment Project two weeks ago. Uh, quote, Super intelligence will be the most impactful technology humanity has ever invented and could help us solve many of the world's most pressing problems. But the vast power of superintelligence could also be very dangerous and could lead to the disempowerment of humanity or even human extinction. While superintelligence seems far off now, we believe it could arrive this decade. We need scientific and technical breakthroughs to steer and control AI systems much smarter than us. To solve this problem within four years, we're starting a new team, co-led by Ilya Satskova and Jan Leica, and dedicating 20% of the compute we've secured to date to this effort. We're looking for excellent machine learning researchers and engineers to join us. Okay, so for listeners who haven't been following this much or possibly uh, at all, uh, can you fill us in on some, some more details of the project? Yeah, very happy to. So basically, if you look at how we are aligning um, large language models today um, is uh, using reinforcement learning from human feedback, which is um, basically a technique where you show a bunch of samples to a human and you ask them which one they prefer for like, you know, a, a dialogue assistant or something. Um, and then that becomes a training signal for, uh, for you know, chat GPT or other AI systems like it. Um, and we fundamentally like don't think that RLHF will scale. Um, and the reason for that is very simple because you know you have humans overseeing AI systems, right? Like you're assuming that they can tell, you know, this this response is better than this other response, or like, you know, they fundamentally understand what the system is doing. And this is definitely true today, because, or like let's say for the most part, because the tasks that ChatGPT is doing just aren't that complex. But as AI systems get smarter, right, they will be able to do harder things. They will be doing things that we understand much less, and um, they will um, will kind of like this fundamental assumptions that that humans can evaluate what the system is doing will no longer be true. Hmm. And so, in order to really like steer and control systems that are much smarter than us, we we will need new techniques. Yeah. Okay, so, so so the current method is to observe the output and then rate how good it has been, um, and then I guess yeah, that that provides feedback that helps to, to to push the model in the right direction. But in future, we just might not be able to evaluate uh, whether the model actually is at, at a deep level doing doing what we want it to do, and so we're going to have to have some some other way of of nudging it in the, in the right direction. Is that kind of the the short version of it? That's right. So. The problem is if you're having a system that is really smart, it could think of all kinds of ways to kind of like subtly subvert us or like trying to, you know, deceive us or lie to us in a way that is really difficult for us to check. And so, you know, one of the, like, I think there's like a lot of really important and interesting research challenges here, which are, you know, like, can we, can we understand how, um, like, how we can extract what the model knows about certain problems, right? Like if it writes a piece of code, can I tell um, which like parts of the code it understand? Like, does it know that there are certain bugs in the code? Um, or can I really understand how the system can e generalize from like easy problems that we can supervise to harder ones we can't? Or, you know, can we, understand how we like make it robust that it can't get jailbroken or that it can't like subvert like the monitoring systems and things like that. Okay, so it's, it's going to be, I guess, uh, as distinct from what OpenAI has already been doing, this is going to focus on models that are like as smarter as humans or smarter than humans or doing things that are quite complicated such that 
uh, <laughs> they're sophisticated enough to potentially potentially uh, trick us or that there could be other failures that, that come up. I guess well, what's going to happen to all of the alignment and safety work that OpenAI has already been doing up until now? Is that just going to continue with a, with, a, with a different team? Or yeah, what's, what's going to happen to it? I think there's a lot of really important work to be done to like ensure that you know the current systems we already have are safe and like they continue to be safe and they won't be misused and that um there's a lot of stuff that's happening around this at OpenAI that I'm really excited about and that I I would be really excited for more people to join um and so this involves you know like fixing jailbreaking and like f finding ways to automatically monitor for abuse um or um you know, questions like that. And, uh, you know, that all that work has to continue. And that work happens, like, in the context of the Czech GPT product. Okay. But what we are setting out to do is we want to, like, solve alignment problems that we don't really have yet, right? So, for example, if you have, you know, like, if you ha have GPT-4, like, help you write a piece of code, you, like... It doesn't really write like really complicated pieces of code, right? It doesn't really write like you know entire complicated code bases, um, and it's not generally smart enough to like uh, put like let's say a Trojan into the code that we wouldn't be able to spot. But future models might do that, and so I think our job is fundamentally trying to distinguish between two different AI systems. One is one that like truly wants to help us, truly wants to act in accordance with human intent, truly wants to do the things that we wanted to do. And the other one just pretends to want all of these things when we're looking. But then if we're not looking, it does something else entirely. Yeah. And uh, the problem is that both of these systems look exactly the same when we're looking. <laughs> right. So it's, it's an so, awkward fact for us. Yeah. That's right. So that makes it an interesting challenge. But we have a bunch of advantage, right? Like we can look inside the model. We can uh, set the model through all kinds of different tests. Um, we can, uh, you can, we can modify and do internals. We can like erase the system's memory. We can like see if it's consistent with other things it's saying in other s situations, right? And so, um, at the very least, you can make sure that you know. It is a very coherent liar with itself. Mm -hmm. But mm -hmm. we really want to do more than that, right? We have to solve the challenge of, like, how do we know it is truly aligned? Yeah. It would be a great science fiction book, I think, to imagine this scenario from the perspective of the, of the AI where... Uh, like it's it's much smarter than the people who are training it. Um, but on the other hand, they can look inside its brain and give it like all of these funny tests in order to try to check whether it's deceiving them. And uh, like, uh, what kind of strategies would you come up with as an agent to work around that? It's gonna be like a real cat and mouse game. Yeah. So I think it's important here that we're not we're not picturing like vastly powerful systems. We're not going to picture systems that are like vastly smarter than us. They might be better than us in like some ways. For example, you know, GPT-4 is much better at remembering facts or it can speak more languages than any human. Mm. Um, but, you know, it's also much worse in some ways, right? Like it can't do arithmetic right, which is kind of embarrassing if you think about it. Um, well, I mean, I can't remember more than seven numbers at a time. So I feel like that's... <laughs> <laughs> we all have our own limitations, right? Yeah. <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, so I think... The goal that we really want to aim for is we want to be able to align a system that is roughly as smart as the smartest humans who are doing alignment research. Yeah. Okay, let's let's zoom into that question a little bit, which is kind of like this question of like what would it take to not only align a system like that, but also like to be confident that it is sufficiently aligned. Um and so uh, basically, the, I think one useful way to think about it is like you want you want to split your methods into two kind of general buckets, right? You have a bunch of training methods that train the system to be more aligned, and then you have validation methods that kind of calibrate your confidence about how the aligned the system actually is. And like as usual, when you do like this train validation split in machine learning, you want to know that it is um, actually, you know, there's there's like no leakage of the validation set into the training set, right? Yeah, can, can you, I guess the, the, the problem would be if 
you've if you're training the model on the same thing that you're using to check whether you've succeeded or not, then of course it could just become extremely good at doing that test, even though it's not uh, not good at the level or it's not aligned in the broader sense. It's just kind of gerrymandered to to to, to not be to, to to have its failures not picked up with it with your test. So you need to have the train that the, the the things that you use to get feedback on to train the model has to be fully separated from the things that you use to validate whether that training has succeeded. Is is that, is that the basic idea? That's right. You don't want to train on the on the test, you know. Yeah, right. <laughs> that makes passing the test so easy. We'll come back to some of those details um, in 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 a minute. Uh, but first, I had a couple of audience questions to to, to put to you. We got a lot of submissions <laughs> from listeners, uh, particularly keen to to, uh, to 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 hear cl- hear clarifications from you. Um, yeah, one listener asked why the target for solving this problem in in four years is that roughly when Jan expects AGI to to arrive. Great question. Um... So I think in general, I would have a lot of uncertainty of how the future is going to go. And like, I think nobody really knows. Um, but I think, you know, a lot of us expect that actually things could be moving quite quickly and systems could ge- get a lot smarter or like a lot more capable over the next few years. And we would really love to be ahead of that. We would really love to have solved this problem wrong, like in advance of us actually having had to solve it or at least mm. ideally like far in advance and so um this four-year goal was like picked as you know kind of a middle ground between you know like how yeah we don't know how much time we'll have but we want to set like an ambitious deadline that we mm. th- still think we could actually meet yeah so okay so it's, it's kind of the most ambitious uh target that doesn't also cause you to laugh <laughs> at, at the possibility that it could be done that quickly That's right. this is this is kind of the best of, case yeah best case a scenario. lot of things can be done in four years yeah um okay yeah another question about uh the, the announcement so the announcement talks about this uh 20 of compute uh that um the open ai has, has secured so far which which is surely going to be <laughs> i guess i don't know all the details about exactly how much compute open ai has but i imagine that by any measure is going to be a pretty significant amount of computational resources um but one skeptical listener wanted me to quote dig deeper on the 20 percent compute stat uh what is open ai's net change in investing in alignment with the super alignment team considering compute and headcount and funding uh and maybe they're increasing investment in alignment but are they increasing investment in capabilities uh as as, as much or more i suppose in particular some people have pointed out that this is 20 percent of compute secured so far and of course like amounts of compute are growing every year so uh that might end up being rel- smaller much like small relative to 20 percent of all compute in in future yeah can you can you clarify this for us yeah so the 20 percent compute uh, secured so far number refers to um everything we have access to right now and everything we've put purchase orders in for and so this is actually really a lot. It's like, I think the technical term is a fuck ton. Okay. <laughs> yeah. It sounds like, I mean, I mean, given that you're just, you're, you're building this team from scratch, uh, you might have like a, a, about the most like compute per person is, or like an extremely high compute per, per staff member, right? Yeah, but I think this is not the right way to think about it because yeah. it's not, it's like compute that's allocated to solve the problem, not necessarily mm. for this particular team. Okay, and so right. one one way this could go is like we develop some methods and then like some other team that's really good at scaling stuff up scales it up and they spend actually a lot of it. Okay. Um, I think another way is, um, I, I think it's not, the, the correct way to think about this is not like, you know, what is it relative to capabilities? I think it's just like, what is it relative to like other investments in alignment and like you know in terms of like how much we've been investing so far i think like this is a really significant step up like not just like a 3x but like a lot more than that mm. um and i think also like it shows that openai is actually really really serious about this problem and like really putting resources behind solving it and they they wouldn't have to have made that commitment right like you know, nobody forced them to yeah yeah, I suppose if if you run out, if you use up this twenty percent, uh, do you think it'll be uh, relatively straightforward to like to get access to additional compute commitments that come out in, in in future years as well? Yeah, so I I would be pretty confident if we have a good plan how to spend more compute, and we're like you know, if we have this much more, we could do this much uh, better on alignment or something. I think we can make a really really strong case for, um, uh, yeah, and I think there'll be a lot more compute. 
if that if that's what it comes down to basically i think that's like the best world to be in if all you need to solve the problem is like to go around asking for more gpus i think we've mostly won yeah. honestly <laughs> yeah um what, what, what why is it so important for this project to have access to to, to a lot of compute yeah so there's a bunch of ways of answering that question. I think like if you look at the history of deep learning over the last 10 years, basically compute has be played a really major role in all of the big headline advances and headline results. And in general, there's like this general recipe that, you know, a lot of simple ideas work really well if you scale them up and if you use a lot of compute to do it. This has been true for capabilities. Um, I expect to some extent this will be true to align for alignment as well. It won't be like only true because I don't think anything we currently have right now is really like ready to just be run at scale. Mm. And there's a real research problem to be solved here. But also, you know, I think the strategies that we're really excited about and the strategies to some extent that we also um, comparatively uh, advantage at investing in are the ones where, you know, you really scale up and you use a lot of compute. Mm. So in particular, you know, if we're thinking about scalable oversight, like we can spend more compute on assisting human evaluation and that will make the evaluation better. Um, or, um, you know, automated interpretability, right? Like if we have a method that we can, um, you know, automatically run over a whole network, we could just spend a lot of compute and run it on the biggest model. Mm. Um, and like ultimately where we want to go is we want to automate alignment research itself, which means we would be running kind of like a virtual alignment researcher. And once we kind of get to that stage, then it's like really clear that you just want to spend a fuck ton of compute to like <laughs> run that researcher a lot. And it will like, you know, It'll make a lot of alignment progress very quickly. Yeah. Okay. Let's first take a step back and survey kind of the current state of the art uh, in, in alignment methods and, and and why you're confident that they're not going to be enough to align ag agentic models that are, are much more intelligent than, than humans. Because one thing I'll add is that uh, you've done this other interview with the AI X Risk Research Podcast, which we're going to link to, which covers a lot of questions that people would be especially likely to have if they're already involved in AI safety. Or, or alignment. Uh, so in the interest of product differentiation, uh, today we're going to focus a little bit more on the questions that people might have if they're coming in from non-safety related uh, ML research, or, or they're just outside machine learning entirely looking on and trying to make sense of, of, of what, what's going on here. So yeah, um, what alignment and safety techniques are currently dominant in cutting edge models? Is, is it uh, just the, the research, uh, well, sorry, the, the reinforcement learning from human feedback that you were talking about earlier? Yeah, that's right. So. Um, reinforcement learning from human feedback is kind of like the popular method today. And it works well because, you know, we can basically humans can look at what the system is doing and tell whether it's good or not. And if you're thinking hard about how to stay scale that, you run into this problem that like basically humans don't scale with AI progress. Right? If we make our AI systems better, humans don't automatically get better. Um and so if you want to kind of scale similarly humans ability to oversee what AI is doing, the obvious path to do this is like to get them to use AI. And so you could picture, you know, like, let's say you have an AI system and it's trying to write this complicated code base or like, you know, a, a complicated textbook or something. Um, and now you could use an assistant like ChatGPT to help you find all the problems in this textbook. And then, like you know, this could be, uh, you know, a future version of ChatGPT or like s that uses a lot of plugins and does a lot of like fact checking and browsing and goes like you know reads a bunch of books and whatnot. Um, but fundamentally, the question is like, why why is this helping, right? And the basic idea behind this is like you're actually making the task easier by assisting evaluation, right? Like if you have an AI system that's like suggesting a bug in the code, it's much easier for you to go and check that this is in fact a bug. Um, and uh, then it is to find all the bugs in the first place. 
And so by having this bug finding system, not only does it help you a lot like overseeing and evaluating the actual code base writing system, um, it is also in self like a, a task that is like easier to su supervise. And you could like picture, for example, training that task with RLHF and then using that task, sorry, that system to evaluate this harder task. And so this is generally like a, a range of, there's a range of ideas like that, that we call like scalable oversight. And that's like one of our main directions. I suppose an, an assumption here is that things would go better if only humans could uh, spend a, a lot of time scrutinizing the outputs of models and figuring out really in what ways were they good and bad and then reinforcing them on that basis, having a like full sophisticated understanding of what has gone well and what has gone badly and reinforcing the good and, and, and um, negatively reinforcing the bad. But as AI progresses, it's going to be producing much more complicated outputs that take much longer for a person to assess or they just may not be able to assess it very well because it's too challenging. Um, or at least, or, or there's going to be like many, many more different kinds of models uh, producing like a wider range of things. And we just don't have the person power. We just don't have enough people <laughs> to properly check these outputs and see where they've gone well and when they've gone badly. And so we could end up giving feedback that's bad. We could end up saying that um, the model did a great job when in fact it did a bad job or saying it did a great job when in fact it was tricking us. And then we're just reinforcing it to learn how to, how to trick us better and learning that that's a successful strategy. Now, so the problem is AI is rushing ahead. Humans are kind of stuck <laughs> at the clock speed that they have where we're not getting any faster or, or any smarter. But um, the magic would be, well, what if we could get the AIs to do the scrutinizing, to do the checking? Because then they get, because uh, <laughs> then the things that you need to check are speeding up and getting more sophisticated at the same rate as the checker is getting getting more sophisticated. Um, is, that, is, that, is that the basic basic idea? Yep, that's the basic idea. And so the point you're making is really good, which, and I kind of want to echo that, which is if you, if you use RLHF, you're basically training the system to avoid the kind of mistakes that, you know, humans would find. And so one way it could go is like the system then generalizes to, oh, I shouldn't make the kind of mistakes humans would find. But actually what you want is you want it to generalize to, oh, I shouldn't make mistakes or like mistakes that, you know, I, I know are mistakes. And this is like a really important dis but subtle distinction. Yeah, yeah, do you wanna, do you wanna, do you wanna, do you wanna elaborate on that? Or, or, so, so they come apart when we give inaccurate feedback. Is, is, is the idea that if our, if our feedback were always accurate in the sense that um, we only say a good job has been done when it, a true, like a true job, a good job truly has been done uh, and that's what we would think if we just like knew everything, if we were uh, incredibly brilliant ourselves, then you can't get this coming apart between uh, like doing doing the right thing and avoiding mistakes that are visible to the to the assessor. That's right. But I I don't know if uh, I don't know about you, but I man, I find it so hard to like actually like we don't have access to ground truth, right? Like we don't yeah. know what's actually true. We, like if you give me a complicated code, there's no way I'm going to find all the bugs, right? Like hmm. um, it is just too difficult. Um, and, but this is like also core part of the challenge, right? Like if you have an AI system that raids a lot of code, which I expect will happen in the future, um, people will want to run that code. And so how do we know that, you know, AI systems aren't secretly placing, you know, backdoors or Trojans or like other security vulnerabilities into the code that they know will miss because, you know, we've trained them with a feedback signal that tells them what exactly what kind of bugs we, we spot and we miss. I see. So, um, so what, in order to make this whole thing work, what, what do we need that we currently don't have? Yeah, so I kind of tease a little bit like, you know, the scalable oversight idea. Um, there's a bunch of other puzzle pieces that we're really excited about that we think are going to be crucial here. The other one is uh, kind of like understanding generalization, right? Like, can we kind of um, really predict and improve how our models generalize from easy questions that we can supervise well to hard questions that we can't? Um, or, you know, like, if we, in other words, right, like, how can we get them to generalize like the thing that we actually want, which is don't write bugs and not this thing that the nearby thing that is basically consistent with all the evidence, which is don't write bugs that humans find. 
Um, and so I think this is like a really interesting and important question, but it's also like, it feels like one of these like core machine learning questions that is like about new, how neural networks really work. Um, and um, it's kind of puzzling that there is so little work that has actually been done on this question. Um, another puzzle piece that might be really important is interpretability, right? Like, these models are, you know, we, we in a sense, we have like the perfect brain scanners for neural networks, for like artificial neural networks, right? We can like measure them at perfect precision at like every like minuscule time interval, and we can make arbitrary like precise modifications to them. And that's like a really powerful tool. And so mm -hmm. in some sense, they're like completely open boxes that we just don't understand how they actually work. Um, and so it would be kind of crazy not to look inside and like try to understand what's going on and like, you know, answer questions just like, what is the reward model that used to train ChatGPT? What is it actually paying attention to? Like how, how does it decide what is rewarded and what is not rewarded? Um, we know very little about that. We know almost nothing. That seems crazy. That's we crazy. Should yeah. really, we <laughs> should crazy. really know that. Um, I've said or, that on the show before, know, that it's just bananas that we don't understand the incentive structure or like how does it think about like what it's trying to do. <laughs> yeah, I mean like, and it's like right there. You just stare at it and like it's a hard problem, but I think we can we can meal, make real progress on that. Um, and then, you know, like there's there's other questions like can we... Um, like, how can we actually make the model really robust, right? Like, so one example is, you know, that we found with the Instruct GBT paper um, is that, like, we trained it on um, basically a, a data set that was almost exclusively English, and it can follow instructions in other languages, right? Like, I can ask it something in German, and we'll still do it. Sometimes it might answer in English, which is also kind of weird. What's mm -hmm. going on there? Mm -hmm. um, and then uh, another example is the jailbreaking, right? Like you've seen all of this uh, with GPT-4. You can make these like pretty simple prompts and then trick the model into doing a task it was trained not to do and like it's not supposed to do. So in some ways, it's not generalized, you know, I shouldn't do bad stuff. It's just, uh, it's generalized in some other way. Like what's going on there? Like yeah, why what, don't we understand that? Yeah, what is the lesson that it's learning if it's not, do, like, don't, if it's not learning, like, don't help people commit crimes. Instead, it's just learning, don't, uh, don't help people commit crimes unless it's, unless you're in a play. Um, yeah, how, how is it not getting these concepts? Yep. And, like, it seems like humans can do this well. So, you know, why, I mean, humans don't do it perfectly, but, like, what's, what's the difference here? Yeah. Um, and so, you know, this is, this is another aspect of generalization that I think we should it would be really important for. Like, would it, it could be really useful for us to understand. And then, uh, finally, like one of the things we want to do is like actually deliberately train deceptively aligned models, like models that try to like lie to us very coherently, or like try to secretly do um, something like self exfiltration, or um, so, so that's that's a model kind of breaking out of the lab. That's right. And because we want to be confident that we could catch these attempts, right? Like we, um, and like the, the straightforward way to be confident is like, well, we deliberately train it and then we check whether it would pass our evals or whether it fly out under a radar. Hmm. But of, of course, if you're doing this, you have to be super careful that you're not like accidentally trying, like creating the thing that you've been trying to avoid in the first place. So um, it has to be done very carefully. Yeah. It seems to me like people have very different intuitions about how likely it is that a model that gets imperfect feedback is going to learn to engage in really de in deceptive behavior. So if you imagine that we train a model and uh, we, we don't want it to lie, and nine times out of 10, we catch it lying and give it negative feedback. But one time in 10, uh, we accidentally say, yeah, you did a good job when it lied. It seems like humans kind of learn this general aversion to lying, even when we think that we might be able to get away with it. Uh, that's kind of, yeah, that's, that's, that's how most people generalize, although I, I guess not all. But so some people think that in that situation, it's just disastrous because you've just 
train the model to engage in the most sophisticated lying possible and, and to trick you whenever it thinks it can get away with it and not when it can't. Other people think it'll have this, no, it'll just learn this general aversion to, to lying and, and, and everything's going to be fine. Do you share my perception that people have very different intuitions about this? And I guess, <laughs> what, what, what are your views if you have any? I think it just makes it clear that we don't know. And I think we should know. And like, I think one of the best ways to figure this out is to try it empirically. To experiment. Right? Like, yeah, I think, and there's so many interesting experiments we can run now run with the models um, uh, exactly of this of this nature. Like we could like try to train them to be better liars and see, you know, like why does it, ha how does it behave? How does it generalize? You know, like our, our overall goal is to like kind of get to a point where we can, you know, automate alignment research. And what this kind of doesn't mean is like we're not trying to train a system uh, that's really good at ML research or that like is really smart or something. Um, that's not super alignment job. Yeah, I think I think a lot of people have been thinking that that's. Uh, <laughs> I think I think they've read your announcement as saying that you're you're trying to train a really good ML researcher, basically. I don't think this would like particularly differentially help alignment. And so this is not, yeah, <laughs> I think it would be good to clarify. I think, so basically what I understand our job is like, we have to figure out the alignment techniques that would make us sufficiently confident that, you know, the system, you know, once we have models that are smart enough, once there's models that like can do ML research or like, you know, things that are close to it, um, I think that is something that's going to happen anyway, and that will happen like whether you know OpenAI does it or not. But our job is kind of to figure out how to make it sufficiently aligned that we can trust the alignment research or like the alignment research assistance that it is producing. Because essentially, if you're kind of like asking this system to help you in your alignment research, there's like this big opportunity for the system to kind of like influence or try to nudge us into believing certain techniques are really good that are actually aren't and thus like let that system or future systems gain power over humans in a way that we actually don't want and that isn't aligned with us and so like what we ultimately need to do is um figure out like how to make that system sufficiently aligned that we can actually trust it and so that means for example if the system helps you know like let's say this for simplicity, right? Like the system writes an alignment paper. Now you can read the paper, um, but like off the, like just off the bat, you might not actually be able to find all the like flaws in the paper. Or like there's also in general, right? Like scientific peer review is not perfect. And there's lots of examples where people go for decades with like fake research before they're being found out. And so this is something that we have to really figure out how to avoid. So. Um, because, you know, alignment research or scientific research in general is a difficult task that humans aren't that good at evaluating, at least not if you like, you know, don't have a lot of time to do it. Um, the question then becomes, what kind of alignment techniques do we need in order to be sufficiently confident that this is the case? So let me give you some examples. Um, so on scalable oversight, um, one of uh, the goals that we could think about is like, let's say we want to get really good at finding all the bugs in code that the model knows about. And so um, how do we do this? Um, one path could be like we're training a model that introduces bugs in code, and then we can see whether our scalable oversight can catch it. And I'm, I can, I'm happy to go into like what kind of scalable oversight we could do here. But I think on the high level, right, there's lots of different ideas and we should just try them all and like see which ones work empirically. And that's why it's important to like measure whether or not it's working or measure whether we are making progress in scalable oversight. And so by training these systems to introduce bugs, you're um, you, like, you know, the system will like kind of be aware of the bugs it's introducing, right? And so, um, the question then is like, if an AI assisted human can find the bug, then, you know, we're good. Or like, do you want to measure like how often they will find it? Or like, how easy is it for us to introduce bugs that the scalable oversight doesn't find? Um, another path is what we call the discriminated critique gap, where basically we train the, a model to be a discriminator between buggy code and non-buggy code, which we can 
you know, generate manually or generate automatically. And then we compare that to, let's say, a critique model that is prompted to describe all the bugs it can find. And so if you end up with a bunch of code samples that the discriminator kind of like flags as fishy, mm. but the critique model doesn't point you to the bug that is going on there, then you know there's like something about the code the model is aware of that you're not finding. And so I think by understanding- How do you know that they're like, both aware of it? It's because they were similar, they were trained in the same way somehow? So I'm like, right now I'm, I'm picturing using the same base model for okay. both the discriminator and the critique model. Got it, yeah. Um, and so like by, looking, by like looking at this in detail, right, you can like get some empirical measurements for like how often does it actually happen um, that, you know, like there is something buggy about the code that the model uh, kind of like doesn't tell you. And then you can do it adversarially, so you're not just measuring in the in the average case. And I think that's a really promising path, not only to like measure we're making progress in skill oversight, because you can picture if you can catch more of these kind of bugs that the 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 model like is aware of, um, then you've you've made skill oversight better. But also like if you actually nail this right, and you're like, oh, well, you get to the point where you're we can be super confident that if there was something fishy about the code, like there's some problem with the code the model is aware of, you find out. That would make you so much more comfortable with then like actually executing this the code to see what happens. Yeah. Okay. Just 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 to back up a second, the basic idea is uh, machine machine learning models that are capable of doing AI research are coming, <laughs> whether whether we want it or not. I mean, may, uh, many people are nervous about that because it could set up this recursive self improvement loop. Uh, so so there could be good reasons to to maybe de delay that moment a bit, but it's, we're not going to be able to probably de to delay that forever. And so what we want to do when that moment comes is, firstly, know ways that we can use. Um, models with those capabilities to do alignment research as well as just uh, non as as well as non alignment um, uh, machine learning research and also essentially we, we, you know it's, it's very essential that we be able to get to a place where we believe that these models are trustworthy enough that we can kind of believe that you know uh, use the help that they're giving us um, on improving our alignment uh, research from the, from, from the stage at, at, at that it's at. We both need to be able to figure out how we can get them to be sufficiently trustworthy that we can use those outputs and also to be able to know that they are, that we've succeeded at doing that so that we in fact do. Um, is, is that, that's, uh, that's the long and the short of it? Yeah, like in, in general, like I wanna be agnostic towards like when exactly this is possible, right? Like when will there be automated alignment, uh, oh, sorry, automated machine le re learning research or like when will models be so smart that they can do that? And like, there might be delays, there might be all kinds of reasons why it f happens later than sooner. Um, the thing I really wanna do is I wanna be ready to use these systems for alignment research once that becomes possible. And so what we don't want to do is like, we don't want to like accelerate this or like make it happen sooner because it will happen soon enough, I think. Um, but we don't, like we want to be ready to then use them for alignment research and like be ready to like kind of um, make alignment progress faster as you know, like ML progress gets faster at that point. Yeah. I think an important part of the vision to, to keep in mind is that it, it might be extremely difficult to uh, align and figure out the trustworthiness of an AI that is just extraordinarily uh, above human capabilities. That is, you know, uh, truly, truly extraordinarily uh, super intelligent because it's going to have so many different ways of tricking you. But the hope here is that at the, at the point when these models are first available, they're going to be more like around human level. They'll be like, a, uh, and they might even have some areas where they're a little bit weaker than than people, uh, but but other areas where they're where, where they're very strong. Um, but because they're not going to be so uh, incredibly capable, it might be easier to figure out whether whether we can trust them because they're not going to have so many options in their in, in their in, in their space of actions, and and they might be somewhat more scrutable because the, the actual things that they're doing in their mind are closer to maybe what what we're doing uh, than what a kind of planet sized <laughs> uh, mind might be, be be able to do. Well, I think many people they they might have a bunch of skepticism about this because they think, well, it's smarter than us, so it's going to always be able to run rings around us, and you could maybe go out of your way to make sure that you're not dealing with a model that's um, um, you know, uh, as capable as, as you possibly could make in order to make it easier to evaluate the, the, the trustworthiness.
Yeah, I, I think that's right. And I think that's a really central point, right? Like if you're thinking about like how do you actually align a super intelligence? How do you align the system that's vastly smarter than humans? I don't know. I don't have an answer. I don't think anyone really has an answer. But it's also not the problem that we fundamentally need to solve, right? Because if you have if this problem like maybe this problem isn't even solvable by like humans who live today. But there's this like easier problem, which is like, how do you align the system that is the next generation? How do you align GPT N plus one? And that is a substantially easier problem. And then even more, if humans can solve that problem, then so should a, a virtual system that is as smart as the humans working on the problem. And so if you get that virtual system to be aligned, it can then solve you know, the alignment problem for GPT N plus one, and then you can iteratively bootstrap yourself until you, you know, actually you're like at super intelligence level and you figured out how to align that. And of course, what's important when you're doing this is like at edge, each step, you have to make enough progress on the problem that you're confident that GPT N plus one is aligned enough that you can, you know, use it for alignment research. Yeah. How is the machine learning community? I, I, I'm thinking of folks who aren't involved in safety or alignment research in particular. Uh, how, how, how have they reacted to the to, to this plan or announcement? Yeah, I think um, in general, people are really excited about the uh, the research problems that like we are trying to solve. And I think, in, like, in in a lot of ways, I think they're like really interested, interesting from from a machine learning perspective. I don't know. I think like the announcement kind of showed that we are like uh, serious about working on this, and that we're like trying to get a really high caliber team um, on this problem, and that we like are trying to make a lot of progress quickly and like tackling ambitious ideas. Um, I think also like especially in the last kind of you know six months or so. There's been a lot of more interest in fr interest from the machine learning community in these kind of problems, and like I think, also, kind of like the success of ChatGPT and similar systems has made it really clear that there's something interesting going on with RLHF, and like there's something interesting about this. There's like something real about this alignment problem, right? Like if you compare ChatGPT to the original base model, like they're they're actually quite different, and there's like something important that's happening here. Yeah. Yeah, I listened back to our interview from five five years ago, um, and we, we talked a lot about uh, um, reinforcement learning from from human feedback because that was that was new and that was the hot thing back, back then. What, was OpenAI or uh, are you involved in in coming up with it with that method? I think more accurately, we're probably like a lot of different people in the world invented it. And like before we did the deep RL from human preferences paper, there were like other previous research that has had done RL from human feedback in various forms. Uh, but it, it wasn't using deep learning systems. And it was mostly just like, you know, proof of concept style things. And then, you know, like the deep RL from human preference paper was joint work with uh, Paul Cristiano and Dario Amade and, and me. And like, I think we kind of all independently came to the conclusion that this is like the way to go. And then we like uh, collaborated. And, that, and that's turned out to be like really key to getting chat GPT to work as well as it as it does, right? Yeah, and it's um, that's right. And uh, it's yeah, it's kind of been wild to me how well it actually worked. And like I, I think if you if you look at the like original like instruct GPT paper, one of the headline results that we had was that actually the you know, GPT-2 sized system, which is like two orders of magnitude smaller than a GPT-3 in terms of parameter count, was actually preferred, like the Instruct GPT version of that was preferred over the GPT-3 base model. Yeah. And so this like vastly saying, cheaper, simpler, yeah. smaller system, actually once you made it aligned, it's so much better than, than the big system. And like to some extent, it's not surprising because you train it on human preferences. Of course, it's going to be better for human preferences. But then... But it packs you know, a huge punch. <laughs> yeah, but also, like, why the hell haven't you been training on human preferences? Obviously, that's what you should do, because that's what you want. You want a system that humans prefer, right? Like, it's kind of, in hindsight, it's, like, so obvious, you know? <laughs> yeah. Coming back to the to, to, to machine learning folks, I guess, what, what parts of the plan, if any, are they kind of skeptical of? Or are there objections that you've been hearing from people? Yeah, I mean, I think 
there's a lot of different views still on like how fast the technology is going to develop and like how feasible is it to like actually automate research in the next few years and I think it's very possible but also like you know it might not happen like nobody actually knows but I think the key thing is that there's like a lot of there's like some really deep and important problems here that we like really need to solve and that are also really tractable and that we can make a lot of progress on over the next few years and in fact by doing this that like this could be incredibly impactful work because you know these are going to be techniques that will shape you know like future versions of ChatGPT and future versions of AI systems that are actually widely applied and like do lots of tasks in the economy and um there's a lot of kind of like e much easier assistant signals that you could optimize right you could optimize the AI systems to like uh maximize customer purchases or to maximize attention and like we've seen like glimpses of that that looks like over the last you know decade or so and like a lot of people don't like that and it's like it is signals that are fundamentally easy to measure, but they're not aligned with humans or like what humans actually want or like long-term human flourishing. And so, you know, in some ways, as AI becomes more impactful in the world, like these, like how well we do alignment will actually have really wide range, wide ranging consequences and like shape society um, in lots of ways for better and worse. And so I think it's really paramount that we do an excellent job at this. Okay, so you mentioned a couple of different ways that things might get automated or ways that you might be able to use these ML tools. So, that, so there was scalable oversight um, and generalization and interpretability. I think I, I think I don't I don't fully get what what, gen, what generalization is as a, as, as, as a cluster. Is it possible to like, yeah, um, explain that again and maybe elaborate a bit more? Yeah, so fundamentally, we want to like be able to distinguish like does the system generalize like true human intent, or does it generalize does what the sy the the human says whenever they're looking, but okay. do something else otherwise, right? And these are like two different like generalizations. They're entirely consistent with the data because you know the behavior is all the same whenever we're supervising, but like. Generalization is like fundamentally a problem about the model and the data. And like, so why can't we just go and try to understand it? Right. Like, so for example, um, what we're doing right now is like, um, we're studying this in like a toy setting. And the way that you could do this is like, you take a data set and you look at um, what does a small language model get correct. And let's say we call these the easy parts of the data set, and then we call the rest the hard part. And so now the question, you can ask questions like, what if we only train on the labels for the easy part and we see how well we can generalize to the hard, the hard part of the data set? Or like, what kind of tricks could we put into the model training that would like make us generalize better, right? And like, um, or another thing you could do is you could just like make a lot of labels from a small model. And like the analogy here is like, you know, if you have humans supervising you know, systems that are smarter than them or like as smart as them, right? Like in some ways we'll be weaker than that system and like our labels will be worse than what the system could do. So how can you recover, like let's say the accuracy that you would get if you just train on the ground truth labels in the first place by only using the weak labels or only using the labels on the easy questions. And like there's some like really concrete experiments we can run here that would then, you know, could tell us a lot for how this is going to go in the real case. And then, you know, once we have that, we can like, and we have developed some tricks, can we use the tricks in a more real setting? Can we like generalize from like, let's say, labels by a small language models on the, you know, chat GPT preference data set to like the actual, like, you know, real chat GPT tasks like done by GPT-4. Like, I think these are like really interesting questions that we like, we can actually run experiments on and like learn a lot. And I think, you know, that not only is this like highly relevant for the kind of alignment problems that we actually want to solve, where like, you know, we're trying to get it to generalize correctly in settings that are hard for us to supervise, but also 
I think we'll learn some really interesting fundamental things about how neural networks learn. Yeah. Have any interesting experiments on generalization been been run already? Are there, are there papers in this on this topic? So there's, I mean, there's there's like a bunch of research in the literature. I think it's like actually surprisingly s like small and like mm. you know this kind of uh, out of distribution generalization. Um, I'm yeah. I think we'll probably have like a pretty exciting paper in like you know two or three months on this topic. And if you find this exciting, right, like the research yeah. team that is working on this is hiring right now. Like we're looking for, let's say, a manager for this team. Like if you like want to be part of like, you know, making this research happen and like like writing our first ever paper, that, like now is the time. Yeah. It sounded like th th there was maybe going to be a project to create, uh, um, or to, to create a model that engages in deception in particular cases, a kind of uh i suppose what's, what's the term we need we need it feels like we need an e coli or we need a drosophila so it's like a, a model organism of like bad behavior in order to be able to study it and see like when does it appear under what conditions how can you how can you reduce it is is that part of this this whole agenda yeah i actually really like how you um how you describe it and so kind of we we called it adversarial testing which is like maybe a lot more mundane but like you know the goal the goal here would be like if we can train like if we deliberately train a model that is deceptive or like tries to deceive us but like maybe in a really mundane way like maybe it just like tries to run a specific python function that does nothing actually but like we can really easily measure whether it succeeded at doing so in a way that like you know invaded other oversight techniques we're using um that will give us this model organism that you described because now we have the system that we want to avoid and we can actually study it. Like we could, for example, you look at it with interpretability tools and be like, can we tell the difference from how this model thinks compared to how like the normal model that we try and think? Or like, can we like uh, can we use our generalization tricks on this model to like kind of make it avoid that pitfall when we're training it? Or like, can we like if we just have like, for example, another property that you'd really want to generalize is, like, uh, tell me the truth. Or, like, maybe more accurately, tell me your best guess at the truth. And, like, to some extent, like, language models have a lot of understanding of the world or, like, a lot of, you know, the, like, they know a lot more about the world than the humans do, right? But they're not always necessarily telling it that. And, in fact... If you look at like how RLHF training works, right? Like you're avoiding the things that you you think are true, and some of the things that you think are true are not actually going to be true, and so you're avoiding the model to make up to like basically lie, and um, but also reversely, some things you know are true, but the model doesn't know. And like for like the, the the basic example is just like anything that happens since the training data cut off. Like the model just has no chance of knowing that. Uh, and then there's like stuff that you don't know, but the model is like, you know, very confident on, like rightfully so. And then, for example, if like it knows a lot about biology, I don't know that much about biology. It knows a lot of biology facts that I don't know. And I wouldn't be able to reliably reward it for like saying this. So like when you're doing this kind of RLHF training, you're actually like making it worse in both cases. In the first case, you like incentivize you're training it to make up stuff and like that isn't true and that could be plausible maybe um, and so you're increasing hallucinations actually and in the second case you're sandbagging the model because you're just you know like you're incentivizing it to not tell you something that it actually knows and there's probably actually like very few things there where the model is like exactly as knowledgeable as the human and so <laughs> like in a way, it's like kind of crazy that RLHF works as well as it as it does. But to to come back to the generalization question, right? Like, what if you what if you could just like somehow get to the model's best representation of the truth? Like, it won't be perfect, but it has like some kind of guess at like what's actually true. And you want to like get the model's best opinion. And like one way you could phrase this as a generalization question, where like we just take a bunch of easy cases where like we are just very confident in the answer, right? Like, who was the first U.S. president? Like, um, and then, like, what is two plus two? Like, these kind of questions where it's like, well, we're not, we have, we have right to be very confident. And then, 
you generalize to hard questions where we're not that call like confident like i don't know like you know some kind of biology question where i don't know the answer or like you know there's cases where like maybe there's very few experts in the world that know the answer but the model does um and so and if you nail that now you can use your model for like as a reward model or for like monitoring or oversight and we use you ask us like is there a uh, like a secret hidden flaw in this code or is there like kind of any bugs i should be aware of or like is there like is is the behavior of this other model uh, like potentially a, a an attempt at like deceiving us or self exfiltration or like you know any of these other things that we we are worried about mm. and uh you know if we can nail that problem we can make a lot of progress there and that would be very useful yeah okay yeah let's talk a little bit more about uh, interpretability i guess to, to tell you where i'm at with with interpretability uh, um is i, I it's, it's very impressive and interesting uh that people have managed to figure out, you know, what algorithms are these neural networks working in order to uh, perceive a particular texture in an image or in order to do a particular piece of inference within a sentence or, you know, in order to figure out, you know, what's the name and how do I make sure that the name is consistent? But then uh, I feel like <laughs> I'm not sure how that would help me to align a system because it's just like all of these like quite small things and it doesn't see, and it doesn't feel like it's adding up to telling me, you know, what are the, what is the goals and the intentions of of this model. Um, I guess Ajaya Kotra pointed out in, in my interview with her a few months ago that you could potentially do a much higher level of interpretability where you would get a model to tell you the truth a bunch of times and lie to you a bunch of times and then see what parts of the network kind of light up when it's in deceptive mode, when it's engaged in lying. Um, and that may be like, in, having interpretability at that higher level of behavior could could turn out to be maybe that would be straightforward to figure out and, and that sounds like it could be could be super helpful but yeah what sort of lines of attack on interpretability that would be useful do you think you might be able to uh you know partially or, or, or automate ultimately you kind of like you you probably just want kind of both aspects of this right like you want something that like really works on the minute detail of how the model works so that you don't miss anything important um, but at the same time, you, like, have to look across the network and, like, because, you know, like, the thing you're looking for might be anywhere. Mm. And so, like, if you want both things at the same time, it's, like, really, you know, like, there's not that many things that have this property. And in particular, you know, the way that humans do interpretability historically is just, like, you stare at parts of the model and, like, see if you can make sense of them, which gives you one of them but not all. And so the kind of, like... Like, so we, we just, like, uh, released a paper on, like, automated interpretability, which tries to do both at the same time. And, like, it's kind of like a first attempt, so it's, like, simplified. And what we do is, like, we ask GPT-4 to write explanations of behavior of individual neurons. And so uh, by just, like, you know, piping a bunch of text through the model, like, recording how much the neuron activates at each particular token, and then... Um, you can ask GPT-4 to just look at that and like just write an explanation. And on average, these explanations are not very good. Sometimes they're good and sometimes they're interesting. And this is like how, for example, we found the Canada neuron that like, fires at a like Canada related concepts. And this is something GPT-4 understood and pointed out and just like you know like wrote this explanation. And then even more, you can measure how good these explanations are, where um, you like run them on a held out piece of text and uh, get GPT-4 to predict how a human would label um, the activations based on the explanation alone. And now you have two things, right? Like you have this automated like explanation writing thing, and then you have um, the automatic scoring function and now you're in business because a you can optimize the score function and uh you can like you know do all kinds of things like for example we did like iterative refinements where like you critique or you revise and uh um the explanations and they will go higher on the score function and at the same time you can also improve your score function by like having it more accurately model how humans would predict how the neuron would activate or like um, having like plugging in a, a more capable model and there's like some problems with this approach too and like you know for example like neurons are probably not the right level of like abstraction that you want to interpret the model in because neurons do a lot of different things like this is what people call polysemanticity 
and uh, the like it's hard to write an explanation that like covers all of the cases. Um, but uh, one thing that's really nice is like you could really run this at scale. And so we like ran it over all neurons in GPD too. And like that's a lot of neurons. It was like three hundred thousand neurons, and you get a lot of text, and you can like then sift through it, and you can like try to find for like look for certain things. Um, but you could also like like you could theoretically like run this on GPD four. It would be really expensive, and then presently it wouldn't be worth it because the explanations just aren't good enough. But it has this nice aspect where like you're really looking at every part of the model, like you're really looking literally at every neuron and like trying to explain what it does. And at the same time, you're running over the whole model. Like it's all like every neuron will be ex try to like explain tries to explain every neuron. And so if we have a technique like that that actually works really well, that would be a complete game changer. Yeah. Okay, so it's, it's part of the idea here that, you know, having a whole team of humans laboriously figure out that there's a neuron that corresponds with Canada is not very satisfying. It's not, not clear where we get from that. But if you could automate it such that you had the equivalent of thousands of, like millions of staff basically scrutinizing like, and trying to figure out what, what each part of the neural network was doing, which you might be able to do if you could automate it, then maybe that would add up to an interesting picture because you could really see, well, it's like all of the, like here's the hundred concepts that were activated uh, when it, when when this answer was being being generated. You know, it was Canada, but it was also uh, you know <laughs> uh, you know <laughs> also a, a particular person and a particular place and a particular attitude maybe, um, and and that and that really would actually help you to understand on some more intuitive human level uh, what what was going on. Yeah, exactly, and I think it's also it's a really nice aspect of this is also that it kind of gives you a glimpse of what like future automated alignment research could be like right like it's like really you can run this at a large scale you can like dump a lot of compute into it and you can do various like traditional capability tricks to make it better um but also like the task that it actually does is like not exactly the task that a human had previously done right like we didn't hire a bunch of humans who like meticulously goes to the nuance in the model and like try to write explanations like that was never an option because it never made sense before right is it the case that a particular model is best or has a particular advantage at explaining itself uh, it feels intuitive to me that gpt4 in some sense might have a it's best understanding of GPT-4's neurons, and so... <laughs> oh, no, I don't know. Yeah, Could sure. you uh, look at your neurons and explain <laughs> them? <laughs> it seems hard. No, okay, but, and but, also the like... but the intuition is coming from if if someone noticed that I had, like, a whole lot of different concepts were associated for me and I would bring them up at the same time, and someone said, you know, what does Canada and the color brown and, like, maple syrup have in common? I'm like, well, uh, oh, I, <laughs> that's a big, I messed up that explanation. I mean, I, but, but, I know, but I know, like, what things are uh, related to me in my own mind, even if I can't look at the neurons. Yeah, and, like, and also, like, there's, like, this really cool, like, thought experiments here where, like, let's say you had a perfect brain scanner on your brain that was, like, yeah perfectly like you know with no lag time and you would just stare at it while you're thinking about stuff mm. like of course it would be a very trippy experience but also <laughs> like it would probably actually let you figure out how your brain works in a bunch of ways yeah. um by just like sitting there and trying to think about stuff and then seeing what happens in your brain and that would just be wild and like <laughs> you know we humans can do can't do that we don't have yeah. the brain scares but like you could literally do that with gpd4 yeah Okay, I, I suppose the skeptic might say, we're going to figure out so at the granular level what functions maybe some of these neurons are serving or what concepts they correspond to, so on. But then it feels like there's a, there's further steps missing before we can use that to really figure out whether a model is aligned. Yep. Do you have any ideas for like what those further steps would be? Yeah, in particular, I think, I mean, the kind of... Like, interpretability seems very hard. Like, it's hard because... There's no a priori reason why the model should be like using very human-like concepts to think about stuff. Human-like concepts are probably somewhere in there because they just empirically useful, right? Like that's mm -hmm. why we we use them and that's why like we've pointed to them. And so they're probably in there. And like there's some concepts that are particularly interesting for alignment research that we would want to be looking for it. Like uh, you know, deception and lying and like, you know, uh other like other things like that that you know are pretty critical how how we want to solve this problem 
And so if you had some kind of way of like automatically surfacing them, I think that would be a big win. Um, I think also in general, like I think interpretability is a really good candidate for like a validation technique where um, we are like, let's say we've like, you know, figured out scalable oversight or like we have a scalable oversight technique we're like really excited about and we like use it to align a model. And then we're like, now we're at this question where we're like, we want to know how good of a job we've done and using the same kind of technique is not good enough. And interpretability, you can then come in and like, you know, if, if you have tools that work really well, you could try to come in and like ask the question of like, can we find any evidence of like deceptive alignment or deception or like, you know, plotting against, you know, humans or like trying to figure out how to self exfiltrate inside the model. And if we do, that's a really bad sign. And we shouldn't just like, you know, train it out. Like you can't train against the interpretability tools, right? Like you will just make them useless or you, like that's likely what will happen. But it's like a validation technique where like if you, if you don't find that, like, and you have good techniques that you know could find it, like, that's some evidence that it is actually, like, you know, as aligned as you think it is. And at the same time, like, if we really nail interpretability, so in this in this sense, like, and any amount of interpretability progress you can make, I think, can be, like, really helpful for this sort of stuff. At the same time, like, if we really nail interpretability, I don't think that we'll, like, I don't know how that will let us solve alignment, right? Like, even if we, like, really understand how it works and then you can, like, you know, try to fiddle with various dials to make it more aligned, but that's, you know, it's not clear that that path will, like, easily succeed if humans try to do that. Um, or, but at the same time, you know, like, we could, maybe there's also a path to making a human-level automated alignment researcher sufficiently aligned to help us really help us do this with no interpretability at all. I think that's also plausible, but you know, whatever we can do will help. And I'm excited to like get as far as possible just because, I mean, we have these permanent perfect brain scanners. It would be insane not to use them. Yeah. Have there been any interesting papers published on, on scalable oversight or interesting results that have come out? There's been a, a bunch of like interesting work uh, in the past year or so. And I think, like, you know, it's not just us, like a bunch of, uh, like, you know, I know DeepMind and Anthropic is also trying hard to try to make it work. Um, I I want to, like, talk a little bit about the, like, critiques work that we did last year, because I think there is some, like, really interesting insights there. So the basic idea here was, like, if we can train a model to write critiques, we can then show these critiques to human evaluators and uh, and then like see if they can help like the human evaluators like make better decisions or like better evaluations. And in some in some sense, like critiques are like the simplest form of assistance, right? Like you it's like a one off, like it's not interactive and it's just like you're just trying to point out one flaw. Um, and like it's also easy in the sense that like it doesn't even have to be a good or accurate critique. You just show a whole bunch and the human will just throw out the ones that they think are bullshit. Um, but like sometimes the critique will point out a flaw that the human would have missed. And in fact, that's what we could show. And this is actually, this is experiments done on GPD 3.5. So this has been a while ago. And like we did these like randomized controlled trials where like we had humans who would either get assistance or not, and they would have to like, uh, find like problems in like, uh, in a summarization task. And you can actually show that the critiques that we had from 3.5 already would help humans find 50% more flaws. Um, and so I think like one of the most interesting things about this work was like actually that we have this methodology for evaluating how well it's working, right? And there's like, there's other ways you can evaluate this too. So like, uh, are there, for example, you can look at like, you know, expert labels versus like, you know, helping non-experts like make uh, like make the find the flaw or do do the evaluation, and but that fundamentally only works if you have access to expert labels. In the general case, that just won't be true, right? Like we want to solve a real task that is really hard and that humans really struggle to evaluate, they won't be good to evaluate it. And for example, like with the code tasks we talked about earlier, is like if you 
um, want to find all the flaws in the code the model knows about. Like humans won't find those. Humans are terrible at finding bugs in code. That's why there's so much buggy code in the world. Um, but the simple trick is like you can introduce bugs in the code, and then you know which part of like which version of the code is more buggy because you made it worse. Um, and so what I'm excited about is fundamentally. I want to try all of the scalable oversight ideas that have been proposed and there's actually measure which of them works best and how well they actually work. And so so this is uh you know like ideas like recursive reward modeling. How can you get like you know human assistants to help humans evaluate what AI is doing? Or like you know debate where you have two AIs that debate each other on a question and like you have a human judge that it decides who of them made like the the more useful statements. Um uh, and uh, or you know like you could have like uh, decomposition where you're like breaking the the task down into like smaller chunks and like you try to solve those, um, or you could do that with like your evaluation. You could you know, like there's like automated market making where you like try to change the human's mind maximally with the assistance and like there's a whole bunch of these variants and like I feel like I have like my personal bets on like which of them gonna work best but like i just want to like empirically see the results and i think what's really exciting is like i think we can just measure it and like it'll be so much better than like arguing over it there's a lot of people out there who are about as informed as as you um who feel that the technical alignment problem is probably extremely hard and uh an effort like this probably only has a has a slim slim likelihood of success but uh you're like you're, you're pretty optimistic about things in in in, in the scheme of it what developments or results have there been uh, that, or that have come out in the last uh, 10 years that have kind of made you have this level of optimism? Yeah, I think actually like a lot of things, a lot of development over the last few years have been pretty favorable to alignment, right? Large language models are actually super helpful because they understand, like they can understand natural language, right? They know so much about humans. Like you can ask them what like, you know, what it would be a moral action under this and this philosophy, and they can give you a really good explanation of it. Um, they also, like, um, you know, you can, by being able to, like, talk to them and, like, express your views, it's like, it makes a lot of things easier. At the same time, they're, in some sense, like, a blank slate, where, like, you can find to them with fairly little data to be so effective. And then, so... If you compare this to like how like you know the path to AGI or like how the you know development in AI looked like a few years ago, it seemed like we were gonna train you know like some deep RL agents in a, an environment like Universe, which is just a collection of like different games and and other environments, and so they wouldn't they might get really smart like trying to solve all of these games, but they wouldn't necessarily have a deep understanding of, of language or like how humans think about morality or what humans care about or how the world works. The other thing that I think has been really favorable is like, you know, what we've seen from the alignment te techniques we've tried so far. So um, like I already mentioned, like instruct GPT worked so much better than I ever had hoped for. Or like even when we did like the deep RL from human preferences paper, I think so. I came into it like being like a f more than even chance that wouldn't even we wouldn't be able to make it work that well in like the time that we had. But it did work, and like instruct GPT worked really well. And like to some extent, like you could argue, like you could argue, well, these are not techniques that align super intelligence. So why are you so optimistic? Um, but I think it still provides evidence that like this is working because if we couldn't even get today's systems to align, like I think we should be more pessimistic. And so the like, converse mm. also holds. holds. Right. Um, I guess, so a skeptic might say, uh, we've seen improvement in our prospects of these models knowing what it is that we want or knowing what it is that we care about. But maybe we haven't seen evidence that they're going to care about what we care about. So they might, yep. so, so the worry would be, you know, the model's going to know perfectly well what you're asking for, but that doesn't mean that it shares your goal. It, it could uh, pretend that it's doing that right up until the moment that it, that, that it flips out on you. Uh, have we seen any evidence for, for the second thing that the models actually share our goals or is that still, that's still kind of a black box? I mean, I think this is a really important point. And I think that's like pretty central to like, some of the main worries about like why alignment might not go well. 
I do still think that like the hu- like the models actually understanding what we want is an important first step. Yeah. But then like the main question becomes how do you get them to care? And that's like the problem that we're trying to figure out. Um but like the first one is like I mean it's so the- great if you already have that. Yeah. Um, w- would you venture to say what your, I guess most people call it P-Doom, or what's, what's, what's the probability that you'd assign to a, to a, to a very bad outcome from, from AI? And, and has that gone up or down over the, over the last year? I don't think it's a really useful question because I think, I, at least I personally feel like my answer would depend a lot more on my current mood than like any actual property of the world. And like, I think in some ways, right, like, I think what's definitely true is like the future with AI could go really, really well, or it could like go really badly. And which way it goes, I think is still so much up in the air. And like, I think, you know, humans just have a lot of causal ownership over which path we're going down. And I think like even individuals or individual researchers can have a big impact in like direction that we're heading. Um, and so I think that's the much more important question to focus on. And then if you actually wanted to give a like a probability of doom, like I think the reason why it's so hard is like because there's so many different scenarios of how the future could go. And like if you want to have an accurate probability, you need to like integrate over this large space. And like I, I don't think that's fundamentally helpful. I think what's important is like how much can we make things better and like what are the best paths to do this? Yeah. Yeah, I, I didn't spend a lot of time trying to precisely pin down my my personal P doom because I, I suppose I feel my, my, my guess is that it's more than ten percent, less than ninety percent. So it's incredibly important that we work to to lower that number, but it's not so high that we're completely completely screwed and that there's and 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 there's no hope. And kind of within that range, it doesn't seem like it's going to affect my my decisions on a day to day basis all that much. So I'm just kind of happy happy to leave it there. Um, yeah, I think that's that's probably the range I would give to. But right. if you want to, so you asked me why am I optimistic, and mm. like I want to, I want to give you a bunch more reasons because I think yeah, there's a lot of reasons, and I think also, I think fundamentally the most important thing is that I think alignment is tractable. I think we can actually make a lot of progress if we focus on it and we effort and put a lot of effort effort into it. And I think you know like. Um, there's a lot of research progress to be made that we can like actually make with a small dedicated team over the course of a, of, of a year or four. Honestly, it really feels like we have a real angle of attack on the problem yeah. that we can like actually iterate on, we can actually build towards. And I think it's like pretty likely going to work, actually. And that's really, really wild and it's really, really exciting. It's yeah. like we have this like hard problem we've been talking about for years and years and years and now we like Finally, have a, a real pathway. shot at actually solving it and that's be so good if we did but some of the other reasons why i'm optimistic is like i think fundamentally um evaluation is easier in genera- gen- generation for a lot of tasks that we care about including alignment research which is why i think we can you know get a lot of leverage by using ai to automate parts of all of alignment research. Um, and in particular, you know, if you, you can think about like classical computer science problems like P versus NP, right? Like you have these kind of problems where it's fundamentally, like we believe it's fundamentally easier to evaluate. Um, it's true for a lot of consumer products. So like if you're buying a smartphone, it's so much easier to pick a good smartphone than it is to buy a, build a smartphone. Or, you know, like in organizations if you like hiring someone it's like it has to be easier to figure out whether they're doing a a job than to do their job otherwise you can't like you you don't know who (laughs) to hire like yeah and like it couldn't it wouldn't work or like if you if you think about like sports and games right like sports wouldn't be fun to watch if you didn't know who won the game and like yeah it's like it is it can be hard to figure out like was the current move a good move but you'll find out later and that's what makes it exciting right like you don't know whether uh, you you have like this tension of like you oh this was an interesting move what's going to happen but like in the end of the game right you look at the chessboard you look at the go board you like you know who won at the end of the day everyone knows or like if you if you're watching like a soccer game like the ball goes in the goal it's a goal that's it everyone knows it's like um yeah and i think you know, it is also true for scientific research, right? Like people, there's like certain research results that 
people are excited about, even though they didn't know how about how to produce them. And like sometimes we're wrong about this, but it doesn't it doesn't mean that we can do this task perfectly. It's just that it's easier. Yeah, a criticism of this approach uh, is, you know, if, if we don't know how to solve the alignment problem, then how are we going to be able to tell whether the advice that these models are giving us on how to solve it is is any good? And you're saying, well, just often it can be a lot easier to assess whether a solution is a good one or whether something works or not than it is to come up with it. Uh, and so that that should make us optimistic that we don't necessarily have to generate all of these um, ideas ourselves. We, we It might be just sufficient for us to be able to tell after they've been generated whether they're any good or not. And that, that could be a much, much more straightforward. That's exactly right. And then there's other things, right? Like, I think we can actually set ourselves up for iteration. Like, I think we can just like stare at the current systems. We can improve their alignment. We can like, you know, we can do stuff like measure whether we're finding all the bugs that the model is aware of. And like, you know, we can set ourselves these metrics and like, yeah, I mean, they're not gonna like take us all the way to like aligning super intelligence, but they will be super helpful for making local improvements. And like, if your goal is, you know, like let's autumn, like like let's align a system that could help us do a, alignment research, right? Like one really good testing ground is like, can you make GPT five more aligned? Like if you, you know, maybe the techniques that you actually need or that you actually care about won't really work that well in GPT five yet. Like who knows? But if you're not making progress along the way, I don't think like you are really making. It's like it's like really hard to make the case that you're actually making progress towards the actual goal. And um, at the same time, like you need some kind of feedback signal from the real world to know that you're, you're improving, you're, you're like doing something that's real. You have to do that carefully, obviously. You can set up an eval that doesn't matter, but um, that's like part of the challenge here. Yeah. Um, any, any, any other reasons for optimism? I think the other really good one is like, well, we're not actually trying to align the system that's vastly smarter than us. And it's always hard if you picture like, a, you know, a dumber system aligning a, a smarter system. And like, if you make the differential really, really large, it seems so daunting. But I think it's also not the problem that we actually realistically have to aim for because we only have to aim for this like human level or like roughly, you know, uh, as smart as the smartest alignment researchers system and if you can make that really aligned, then you can make all the progress that you could make on this problem. And so, like, originally, when I set out to work on alignment research, right, like, this realization wasn't clear to me. And I was like, oh, man, this problem is hard. Like, how do we do it? Um, but if you're shooting for this, like, much more modest goal, this minimal viable product, it actually becomes, a, a, like, looks, like, so much more achievable. Yeah. Could, so could, could you stylize the approach as uh, saying, don't obsess about whether you can align GPT-20. Uh, let's work on aligning GPT-5. And then in collaboration with GPT-5, we'll figure out how to align GPT-6. Uh, and then in collaboration with all of them, uh, we'll work together to align GPT-7. That's, that's the yeah. that's kind, of, kind of the basic idea. Yeah, or like, you know, and like you want to do this empirically. Like maybe you mm. look at GPT-5 and you're like, well, the system isn't still isn't smart enough, right? Like, so we tried this a whole bunch with GPT-4, like trying to help get it, like fine tune it on alignment data, try to get a help in our research. It just wasn't that useful. That yeah. could happen with GPT-5 too. But then we'll be like, okay, let's focus on GPT-6. But like, you know, we want to be on the ball when this is happening and we okay. want to be there, you know, when it becomes possible and then like really go for it. Okay, so, so that's, that's a bunch of reasons for optimism. Um, I want to go through um, a couple of objections or ways that this might uh, not not work out as as hoped. I guess one that I've seen a lot of people mention is just how are you going to be able to tell whether you're succeeding? Um, you know, you, you might think that you're that, that this is working, but how would you ever really have confidence? And I suppose especially if uh, if there's successful deception going on, then then you could uh, be lulled into a false sense of of, of security. Yeah, what do you think about how, how could you tell? And this, I mean, this is one of the central problems right like how do you distinguish the deceptively aligned system and you know the truly aligned system and this is the challenge that we're trying to figure out this is why we're looking at like can we get the model to tell us all the bugs that it's aware of and this is why we like want to train deceptively aligned models to see if they can pass our evals and like stress testing our methods and like really drilling into like what's you know, drilling into what's going on inside of the model. Like, I think we can learn so much about this problem and, like, um, really 
like scope and understand like the risks that remain or like the areas where like we are most uncertain about how to it could deceive us yeah so i suppose so, so it could fail at you could fail at the first step perhaps where the first model that you're trying to collaborate with in this project isn't aligned but you don't realize that and so it just starts leading you down a, a bad path uh, and then at some point things will go will go badly but it ultimately uh the problem was at that at the very beginning and then i guess you could have th you could also start out well but then not be able to tell whether you know the, the, the further iterations are going in, in in the right direction like problems could creep in there and and you're not noticing them uh, and so that could lead you down a down, down a bad path um and i guess it sounds like you're just saying this is the problem that we have to solve uh like yeah things things might fail in all of these different ways and that's why we need people to come and figure out how to how to gain confidence exactly and i think like fundamentally the thing i'm not i'm much more worried about the question can we really precisely know how aligned the system is uh, than I am about the question of like, how can we make it more aligned? Because I think a lot of the risks come from uncertainty about how aligned the system actually is. So in the sense that like, I don't think anyone will be excited to deploy a system that you know is misaligned and that wants to take over the world. Um, but if you like, so if you can like precisely measure how aligned the system truly is, or like if you if you're confident in your measurement apparatus that like you know tries to understand how aligned the model is, then I think you've actually solved a large part of the problem because mm -hmm. then you know where you're at, and like you can also like then you know then you can much more easily work in methods that improve alignment, and you have to be careful the way you do it so you don't like you know train on the test set. But I think fundamentally the problem is like. A lot of the problem is just like know exactly where you are. Yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, someone from the audience had this question. Yeah. How do you plan to verify ahead of time before the first critical try that the alignment solution proposed by AI scales all the way to superintelligence and doesn't include accidental or intentional weaknesses? Uh, and, and what happens if it does? So I guess it's just people are very nervous. <laughs> people are very nervous that if this doesn't work out, it's pretty scary. Honestly, like, I mean, it's kind of like a really high stakes problem. Um, and that's, I think, what makes it like so important to work on. But also, I think it's like really oversimplified to like have a mental picture where like we we have this automated alignment researcher, we press a button, it, it says like, here's what you should do. And then we just do it and hope for the best, right? Like, I don't think that's the first this, this thing the system does is align super intelligence. I think it'll just align GBDN plus one and it'll be like, we'll be like very in the loop and like looking all of the results and we'll like, you know, publish it and like show it to others and be like, what do you think about this result? Do you think this is a good idea? Should we do that? And I think like at the same time, we'll have like all of these other tools. We'll like hopefully have much better interpretability. We'll, you know, like we'll understand like, robustness of our model is much better or like we have like a lot of automated tools to monitor as the system is doing its alignment research where like all these automated tools will be looking over its shoulders and trying to like make sense of what's going on um or like you know if we can really understand the like generalization on a fundamental level like can we have a system that we we are much more confident generalizes the way humans would actually want and not the ways that like you mm. know we would say we want or like ways that we can check or something and if we fundamentally understand these problems or like we do a good job at like improving in these directions um i think we'll just have so much more evidence and so much more you know reasons to believe the system is actually doing the right thing or it's not and like that's what we're trying to figure out yeah so the announcement of this project says uh we don't know how to align superintelligence now. And if we deployed uh, superintelligence without having a good method for aligning it, then that could be absolutely disastrous. What happens if in four years time, you think that you haven't solved the issue or in eight years time or 10 years time, you're just like, well, we've been working at it. We've made some progress, but I don't, I don't, I don't have confidence that we're, that we're close to being able to align uh, superintelligence, but the capabilities have really gone ahead and we might be close to deploying the kind of thing that you would be really worried about deploying if it weren't aligned. Is there a plan for how to, <laughs> to, to delay that deployment if you and your team just think it's a bad idea? Yeah, I think the most 
important thing at that stage is like we just have to be really honest with where we at. Like we have to, and in some ways, like I think the world just needs like it will demand us to be honest, right? And then mm -hmm. like not just like say what we totally believe, but also like show all the evidence that we have. Um, and I think. You know, if you get to this point where like the capabilities are really like powerful and um but at the same time our alignment methods is are not there. This is like when you really be making the case for like, hey, we should all chill out, like and not just you know, this doesn't this isn't primarily about open AI, right? This at this point there's just like, you know, you you gotta get all the AGI labs together and like, you know, figure out how to um yeah solve this problem or like allocate more resources right. like slow down capabilities i don't know what it will happen but i think that you know the prerequisite is still like you gotta figure out how you where you're at with alignment right like we still have to have tried really hard to solve the problem for in order to like be able to say look we tried really hard here's all the things we tried here's the results you can look at them in retail and we like if you looked at all of this you would probably come to the same conclusion as us which is like you know we did, we don't think we're there yet and like mm. that's why i'm saying like we just need to be really honest about it yeah um and then like, this is why like we also like making this commitment like we want to share the fruits of our effort widely like we want everyone else's models to be aligned too right like we want everyone who's like building really powerful AI, like they has, it should be aligned with humanity. And we want to tell other people like all the things we like figure out about how to do this. Yeah. I see people worried about various different ways that, um, you know, you, you can make some progress, but not get all the way there. Uh, but then people could end up deploying anyway. So I, I guess one concern people have is that you might be overconfident. So you might fall in love with your own work and feel like you've successfully solved this problem when, when you haven't. I guess another thing would be, Maybe you'll say to other people at OpenAI, we don't feel like we've solved this issue yet. I'm, I'm really scared about this. But then they don't listen to you because maybe there's some commercial reasons or, I don't know, internal politics or something that prevents it from helping. And I guess another method would be, well, the people at OpenAI listen to you, but the rest of the world doesn't and someone else ends up deploying it. I guess I don't want to <laughs> heap the weight of the universe on your shoulders. Um, but yeah, do, do you have any comments on these different possible, uh, possible failure modes? Yeah, I mean, I think that's why, like, you know, we want to be building the governance institutions that we we need to like get this right, right? Like, um, I don't think at the end of the day, I don't think it'll be up to me to like decide like you know is this now safe to go or not. Like we are doing like safety reviews internally at OpenAI before a model goes out. There's like the OpenAI board that has the last say over like is this OpenAI going to do this or not, and like. Uh, as you know, like OpenAI has this complicated like cap profit structure, and like the nonprofit board is actually like in charge of what OpenAI does, at, like ultimately. And so you know they can just decide to make the call of like we're not deploying, even though there's a commercial reason to. Um, and then like for the world in general, right? Like in a, at the end of the day, like it's like it can affect everyone, and like you know there's. You know, governance governments have to get involved somehow, or like we need like something like an uh, international energy uh, agency for um, atomic energy for AI that can like make these help make these kind of decisions in a technically grounded way. That's why, like, I think like what the kind of things that I want to do and that we want to do with super alignment is like zoom in on the technical challenges, like really understand where we are, but also actually make progress on the problem and like try really hard uh, and focus on actually solving it mm, yeah um an, an objection that i don't think i've seen but but one that occurred to me when i was um uh re reading about the, about the approach is could it be the case that it's actually easier to self exfiltrate that is kind of break, for a model to break out of the lab and do something really bad, like release bioweapons, or you know, invent new bioweapons and, and release them and cause an enormous amount of damage. That that could actually be an easier skill than aligning AI, and so we might possibly hit that cap that capability, the capability to do a ton of damage before these models are actually very helpful to to you and your team in in making progress on on alignment. Yeah, I think self exfiltration is one of the like really key like capabilities to be looking at because you know like 
there's a really important difference between the uh, like the system being at the lab and like you know in our data center in a way that we can control it right like we can turn off the data center we can like spin down the engine we can delete the snapshot if we want to and whether it's like out in the world and it's like trying to sustain itself or it's trying to um like i don't know build better ai models and so the question then becomes like you know how can you like measure like whether the model can like break out or like you know can it say introduce security vulnerabilities or exploit security vulnerabilities that exist in our infrastructure right now it can't do that but like future models could um or can it like persuade an open ai employee to help it exfiltrate its weights right that's the other path like you just try to persuade humans you come up with some arguments that are believable to them why they should do that could be pretty hard i don't know i don't like gpd4 can't do this but like future models might and so i think looking at this is like a really important distinction and then going to your question like what if this happens first right like i think to some extent where right, like you can make self-exfiltration harder by just like traditional security measures but at some point this will be an alignment problem where like you actually have to show that the, sh the system is not trying to break out it's not it doesn't want to i think there's a lot of uncertainty in general like over like how the technology go will go and like what kind of abilities will be unlocked first but i'm i'm pretty optimistic that we will get a lot of really useful stuff out of the models before um you know this 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 kind of thing can happen but like of course that's why we need to measure this because we can't just like make some wild guesses yeah okay yeah so so those are some objections i've read online and one one for me but i guess i'm curious to know what if, if you're playing devil's advocate um what's the best argument against this whole approach that that you're taking in in in, in your opinion yeah i think you can object on a bunch of different levels like i think um, you could object like that automated alignment research, um, you know, will come too late to really help us, as you mentioned, right? Like we have to solve a lot of the problems themselves. And like, you know, in some extent, if that's true, like we are still probably going to do the same things we're doing now, which is just like, we're trying to make more alignment progress so that we, you know, we can align more capable systems. And then to some extent, you know, that also means that you're kind of raising the bar for like the first like catastrophically misaligned system, for example. Um, I think there's like more detailed objections that you could make on like how we like build our research portfolio of like, you know, the particular paths that we're excited about, like um, scalable oversight, generalization, robustness, adversarial testing, that sort of stuff, uh, interpretability. Um, and we, we can go into like, you know, details of like each of these paths and like, you know, why, um, like what I think the best objections are to, to each of them. Uh, and then the, you can also say like, you know, why, why are you doing this job like at an AI lab, right? Like, mm -hmm. aren't you going to face like some competing incentives? Like you mentioned with like, oh, but the lab wants to deploy and like, you know, how do you square that with like wanting to be aligned as, as aligned as possible? And um, I think fundamentally, uh, you know, AI labs are one of the best places to do this work just because you are so close to technology. You like see as, as it's being developed, right? Like we got to try a lot of things with GPT-4 before it came out. And we like really, because we were like hands-on at like aligning it, like we know exactly where we're at and like what are the weaknesses and like what actually works. And I think that's pretty useful. I think also like, you know, AI labs are really well resourced and, you know, they have an incentive to spend on alignment and like they should yeah. and it's great. Yeah, um, I think I think I don't share that objection. It reminds me of the, what's, what's, what's the quote? Uh, why do you rob banks? And he says, uh, that's where the money is. I feel like, why why would you do alignment research at OpenAI? That's where all the cutting edge research is. That's where the cutting edge models are. Uh, so it's, yeah, the, the case kind of I writes mean, itself. Yeah, there's like, I mean... I don't think OpenAI is the only place to do good alignment work, right? Like, there's lots of other places that do good alignment work, um, but I think it's yeah. Really, yeah. Just clear it has has it has some has some big advantages. Uh, yeah, I'm not saying everyone should necessarily work at uh, OpenAI or one of the labs. There's things you can do elsewhere, but uh, but sure, surely some people should be should be at the labs. Maybe a good way of approaching this question of um like the the, the best 
the, the biggest weaknesses or the, or the best um, best objections is uh, if you couldn't take this approach uh, and the super alignment team had to take a different, a quite a, quite a different approach to, to to solving this problem. Do you have kind of a second favorite option option in mind? Yeah, I think, and and to be clear, I think our general path and approach will change over the four years, and we'll probably add more uh, research areas as we learn more, and like maybe we we give up on some other ones. I think that's the natural course of research. I kind of want to modify your question a little bit because I sure. I think like. Right now, we are doing the things I'm most excited about for like aligning, you know, human level or like systems. Um, I think in terms of other things I'm excited to see in the world that we're not doing is like, I think there's a lot of work to be done on evaluating uh, language models that we are not doing. Like, can you like, you know, like measuring like the the ability to self exfiltrate for example it would be mm -hmm. super useful if we can get more of that i think there's a lot of kind of like interpretability work on smaller models or open source models that you can do where you can have make a lot of progress and have good insights we're not doing that because like our comparative advantage is to like work with the biggest models that's why we're like focusing on automated interpretability research that's why we are like trying to like you know poke at the internals of GPT-4 and see what we can find. I think that's something we're well, well positioned to do. I also f still have conviction that there's like interesting and useful like theory work, like mathematical theory work to be done in alignment. I think it's like really hard because um, I, I think we, we don't have like a really good like scoping of the problem. And like, I think that's the, probably the hardest part by far. Um, but I think ultimately like, Maybe the reverse of the question is like, what are the things that we have an advantage at doing at OpenAI, right? And this is like, use the biggest models, like like go bet on paths that leverage a lot of compute to solve the problem. Um, work in small teams, like work closely together, but don't focus on like publications per se. Um, like we're not, we're not writing a lot of papers, right? Like we're trying to, uh, push really hard to solve like particular aspects of the problem, and then when we find something interesting, we like we'll write it up and share it. But you know, we're not. If it's not a lot of private papers, that's fine. It's like that's not what we're trying to do. Um, and so, like another focus that we have is like we focus a lot on kind of engineering, right? Like if you're like we want to run empirical experiments, we want to like figure out. Um, uh, you know, you want to like try a lot of things and then measure the results. And that takes a lot of engineering on large code bases because we are using these giant models. We're not always using them, right? There's a lot of interesting experiments you can run on smaller models. Um, but uh, at the end of the day, like, a, you know, a fair amount of the work is, you know, ML engineering. And that's something that we are well positioned to do as well. Is there any way that this plan could not work out that keeps you awake at night that we haven't already already mentioned that's worth flagging oh man there's so, so many reasons i think <laughs> uh i mean there's like you know like what if uh you know our scalable oversight doesn't actually work or we can't figure out how to make it work or like are we actually measuring the right thing i think that's like a, also a lot of thing i'm like keep circling in my head like how can we improve what we're measuring. Like for example, with automated interpretability, we have this like score function that tries to measure like how good is the explanation of the neuron, but it's approximated with a model. It's like not actually like using a human. And there's like, you know, you do, wouldn't want to just optimize that function. I don't think you would get what you were looking for. And to some extent, that's like the core of the alignment problem is like, how do you find the right metric? The like metric that you can actually optimize. And so this is like something I, I worry a whole lot about. Um, and then there's also just like, you know, are we making the right research bets? Like, should we be investing in this area more? Should we like invest in this other area less? Like, uh, yeah. so there's many ways things can go wrong. It, so, so at the point where these models are giving you research ideas, they're they're trying to help you out. It seems like you need to keep need to have a lot of people in the loop somehow checking this work. Um, making sure that it makes sense, like cross-checking for, for deception and so on. It, it seems like it could just absorb a lot of people doing that. And it, would it be possible that the the project could fail just because you don't have enough FTEs? You don't have enough people working on it in order to keep up? Yeah, I mean, we're really trying to hire a lot right now. 
and I think like the the team will will grow a fair amount over the the four years. But I think ultimately, like the real way for us to scale is using AI, right? Like with the compute commitment, we could like have like millions of virtual FTEs if you so want, and like that's not a size that the super alignment team could ever realistically grow, like in terms of humans. And so that's that's why like we want to bet so hev- heavily on compute and like bet so heavily on like that kind of path. But, but if you got kind of a ratio of a million AI uh, staff to one human staff member, isn't it possible for it to kind of lose touch? Like you kind of want, hu- you, <laughs> the thing is that you kind of trust the alignment of the humans, even though they're worse in other ways. So they're the ones who are doing some ultimate checking that things haven't gone out of control or that like bad ideas aren't getting getting through, admittedly with with, with assistance from, from others. Um, but yeah, is, do, do, do you see what I'm? Do you see what I'm worried about? Exactly. But this is like <laughs> this is the problem we're trying okay. to solve, right? <laughs> right. Like, okay. yeah. we have like a large amount of work that will be going on, and mm. we have to figure out which of it is good. Like, is there something shady about any of it? Like, what are the, the results that we should actually be looking at? Like, and so on and so on. And this is like, right? Like, how do you solve this problem? Is the question we're asking, right? Like, how can you scale? How how do you can you make scalable oversight work so that you can trust? you know, like this large amount of virtual workers that you're supervising or like, how can you like, how can you improve generalization? So you just like, you know, they will generalize to do the right thing and not like do the thing that the human <laughs> wouldn't notice that I'm doing or something. Well, do, does it end up becoming a sort of pyramid structure where you've got like, you know, one person and then they've got a team of agents just below that uh, who they supervise. And then there's another team of agents below, like at, at the next management level down who are doing another kind of work that are reporting upwards and then you have like layers, layers below. Uh, is that one way of making it scale? Yeah, I mean, you could you could like try to have like a more traditional looking company. I don't think that's literally how it's going to go. I think probably like, and also like, I mean, one thing we've learned from machine learning is like, you know, systems are often just really good at some tasks and like, worse than humans at other tasks. And so you would preferentially want to delegate the former kind of tasks. Um, and also, like, I don't think, you know, the the way it will be organized will look like, you know, the way that human organize themselves because our organizations are tailored to how we work together. Um, but, like, these are all really good questions. Yeah. These are questions <laughs> that, like, <laughs> we, we need to think about and we have to figure out, right? Yeah. So you and your team are going to do your your absolute best with this, but uh, it might not, it might not work out. Um, and I suppose if uh, if you don't manage to solve this problem and we just barrel ahead with the capabilities, then the end result could conceivably be that everyone dies. So in that situation, it seems like humanity should have some backup a backup plan, probably hopefully several backup plans, uh, if only so that the whole weight of the shoulder, uh, world isn't resting on your shoulders and uh, you can get some sleep at night. What sort of backup plan uh, would would, uh, would, you, would you prefer us to have? Did you have any, uh, any any ideas there? I mean, I think there's a lot of other kind of like plans that are already in motion. There's like, this is not like the world's only bet, right? Like there's, uh, you know, alignment teams at, 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 like at Anthropic and DeepMind, they're trying to solve a similar problem. There's like, you know, um, there's like various ways that you could like try to uh, like buy more time or like various like other governance structures that you want to put in place to like govern AI and like make sure it's like used beneficially. Um, yeah, I think like solving the core technical challenges of alignment are going to be critically important, but I won't be the only ones, right? Like we still have to make sure that like AI is aligned with some kind of notion of democratic values or like, you know, like something that tech companies decide unilaterally. And like, we still have to do something about like misuse from AI and like, yeah, aligned systems like wouldn't let themselves be misused if, if they can help it. But, you know, there's still a question of like, how does it fit into the larger context or like of like what's going on in, in like in society, right? Like you could be, as a human, you can be working for an organization that you don't really understand what it does, and it's like actually neck narrative without like you being able to see that. Um, or like you know, if like just because we can align open AI's models doesn't mean that somebody else builds unaligned AI. Like, how do you solve that problem? That seems really important. Um, how do you like 
make sure that AI doesn't differentially uh, empower like you know people who are already powerful, but like also helps mar marginalized groups. That seems really important. And then ultimately, right, like you also want to uh, be able to avoid these structural risks where let's say we solve alignment and like everyone makes a system that's really aligned with them. But then, you know, like uh, what, what ends up happening is that you kind of like just turbocharge the existing capitalist system where um, essentially co corporations get really good at like maximizing their shareholder returns because they that's what they align AIs to. But then, like, humans fall by the wayside where, like, you know, that doesn't necessarily encompass all the other things you value, like clean air or something. And we've seen, like, early indications of this, right? Like, global warming is happening, even though we know the, the fundamental problem. But, like, progress and, like, yeah, uh, all the economic activity that we do still drives it forward. And so, even though we, like do all of these things right, we might still get into a system that like is ends up being bad for humans, even though um, nobody actually who participates in the system wants it that way. Um, so, so you're going to do your job, but a lot of other people have also got to do their jobs. <laughs> a lot that's of other right. people in this broader ecosystem. There's a lot to do. We need yeah. to make the future go well. And there's, uh, that requires many parts, and this is just one of them. OK. Let's skip now to some audience questions, which, uh, as I said, were were particularly numerous and, and, and spicy this time around. Um, these questions are probably going to jump around a little bit, but I, I think uh, just throwing these at you uh, will give give us a good impression of, of, of I think what's what's on, what's on people's minds. Yeah, um, let's do it. Yeah, okay. Uh, first one: uh, Why doesn't OpenAI try and solve alignment with uh, GPT four first? Um, so for example, get it to the point where there are zero jailbreaks that work with GPT four uh, before risking catastrophe with with more advanced models. I think this is a great question, and like to some extent, right? Like the fact that you can like point to like all the ways that alignment doesn't quite work yet, right? Like jailbreaks is one of them, but also like hallucinations, right? Like the system just makes up stuff and like it's a form of like lying that we don't want in the models. Um, but I think to some extent, like getting really good at that wouldn't necessarily like help us that much at solving the hard problems that we need to solve when aligning super intelligence, right? Like I'm not saying we should stop working on those, but we also need to do the forward looking work. And in particular, the thing that I want to happen is like, I want there to be the most alignment progress uh, across the board as possible. And so when GPT-5 comes around or like when, you know, like as models get more capable, that we have something that's ready to go and we have something that's like, you know, helps a lot with those kind of problems. Okay, yeah, another question. Does the fact that GPT-4 is more aligned than GPT-3.5 imply that the more capable the model is, the more aligned it will be? I know not everyone is going to accept the premise here, but yeah, what would you say to that? Yeah, I think, and like, I think people also have pointed out that, um, you know, because GPT-4 is still jailbreakable, you know, and it is more capable in some case, in some sense, like the worst case behavior is worse. So like, even though on average, it's much better, mm. um, you can make a case for that. Um, but I think it's also, even if it was just like better across the board, I think it would be like, I don't think at all we should bet on that trend continuing, right? And there's like plenty of examples of like uh, cases in uh, machine learning where you get like some kind of inverse scaling, right? Like it gets better for a while and then it gets worse or like, you know, and, and to some extent, you know, we know the models haven't read, reached this critical threshold where they are as smart as us, or they could think of like a lot of really good ways to try to s deceive us, or like they don't have that much like situational awareness, like they don't know that much about like you know they're that they are in fact a language model that's being trained and how they're being trained. They don't really understand that, but once they do, it's kind of a different ball game, right? Like you kind of going to be facing different problems, and so just like extrapolating from some kind of trend that we see now, I don't think would be right in either way. But I do think it is like you can learn something from it. You just, I don't think you should jump to that conclusion. Yeah. Um, what's most intellectually exciting about this project from, from a mainstream ML perspective? I think we will learn a lot about how 
big neural networks actually fundamentally work, right? Like if you think about the work that we're trying to do on generalization, like it is weird that we don't understand why models sometimes generalize in one way and sometimes in another way, or like how can we change the ways that we can generalize, they can generalize, like why can't we just like list all the possible ways and then like see like like which ones work or like how can we get in them into each of the ones or like what's the mechanism that really happens here? Like we don't know that and why don't we know that? Or like I think if you think about interpretability, just like being able to like understand the mechanisms by how the models like are like deciding which token to output next will teach us a lot about like what's going on there like what is how does it actually work like what is I don't know it's like it it's like weird, on, right? on some level this is the whole thing this is like it's the whole this thing is the core like, of the whole, <laughs> I suppose so so I mean from what uh, yeah People are spending enormous amount of effort increasing capabilities, right, by just throwing more compute and more data into these models. And then they could just get this further inscrutable machine that they don't understand. That is like very cool in a way because it could do stuff. But it sounds like at some point, like maybe the more interesting thing is how does it work, uh, which, which, which is what you're going to be working on. Yeah, but they at the same time, right? Like there is really concrete things you can say, right? Like hmm. let's say induction heads, right? Like you can find these like attention heads that do very specific things like induction. You can find like, you know, somebody reinverse engineer like the circuit that does arithmetic, uh like for like simple arithmetic in a small model. Like you can actually do that. Or like, you know, we found the Canada neuron. There's like a neuron in GPT two that just reacts to Canadian, Canadian concepts. And it's like, it's just there, we found it. Like, yeah. you, there's like so much still to find, be, find because we just know so little. And it's <laughs> so, kind of yeah. crazy not to look at that. Yeah, I imagine that there are some structures in these networks that are going to be analogous to things that the human brain does. Um, and we will probably be able to figure out how they work in these networks long before we figure out how they work in the human brain because we have perfect data <laughs> about all of exactly. the weights and activities of this exactly. model. So it seems like exactly. yeah, all of the people studying the brain should just switch exactly. over and start working on understanding It's so much GPT easier. Your life will be so much easier. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I think that's like, I, I don't know why not more people do it. It seems so compelling to me, yeah, but I'm not a neuroscientist. So yeah. Um, and um, like uh, maybe some of the insights will also transfer, right? Like, you know, you can find uh, some of the, like, neurons that we know, like, vision models have that you can also find in humans and animals or, like, you know, these kind of, like, edge filters or, like, you know. Or if uh, you look at, like, reinforcement learning, where you have evidence for, like, how reinforcement learning works in the human brain. But we have so much more evidence how it works in neural networks because we freaking build it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's just, like, so much easier. What do you think have been the biggest wins in, in technical AI safety so far? I think if I had to pick one, I think it would probably be RLHF. I think in some ways, like I, I think RLHF really put alignment on the map. And I think it also demonstrated that alignment has a lot of value to add to how systems are be actually being built. I think the fact that it actually had a whole bunch of commercial impact has been really good because... Um, it kind of like really demonstrates like real world value in a way that, you know, if you if you're just working, if you're trying to solve this abstract problem, right, which is aligning super intelligence is a super abstract problem, right? And like you could kind of like noodle on it for many many years without like making no clear measurable progress, and I think not only does like RLHF has this like really visceral difference between like how the model was before and how it was a after that, like everyone can really like see when they play with it, but also like it makes it clear that this is like an area that's really worth investing in and like, you know, taking a bet on like all the, like, you know, even the things that, you know, aren't like obviously working yet or like aren't like clearly like, you know, might not like might be still in the stage of like being really abstract. Yeah. Is there a is there a number two? I 
I think there's a number of smaller wins that we've had. Like, I think it's, like, hard to make these, like, you know, rankings. I think if I wanted to add other things, I think interpretability of vision models has been pretty impressive. And, like, I think there's been a lot of progress in that. And uh, I think it's, like... If you're asking like, in terms of safety impact, I think, or like alignment impact, it's maybe less clear because the thing, like, there's no like things you can really point to that follow directly from that. Okay, yeah, here's a question that uh, was kind of a recurring theme uh, among among listeners. Um, yeah, what gives OpenAI the right to develop artificial general intelligence without democratic input as to whether we want to actually develop these systems or or not? This is an excellent question. I think it's also a much wider question. Like why, like, I, I think we should have democratic input like to a lot of other things as well. Like, you know, how does the model, how should the model behave? Or like how, you know, like, should we like deploy it in this way? Should we deploy in this other way? Um, and, and in some ways, like, you know, OpenAI's mission is like develop AI that benefits all of humanity. But like, you know, you have to give a humanity a say into what's happening. Um, this is not what like the super alignment team does, but I think it's going to be very important. Yeah, I guess it sounds like you're just on board with there needs to be some integration between the AI labs and democratic politics where... The, like the public has to be consulted, people have to be informed about the risks and the benefits that come here, and there needs to be some sort of collective decision about when and how these things are going to be developed and and deployed. And I guess we just currently don't have the infrastructure to do that. Um, and I, yep. I mean, I guess I guess that's partly OpenAI's responsibility, but it's also partly everyone else, like the responsibility of the whole of society. Uh, as long as OpenAI is willing to collaborate in that, then um, there just needs to be a big effort to make it happen. I think that's right. And like, I think... I'm really happy that OpenAI is really willing to speak openly about the risks and like speak openly about like where we are. And like I see my responsibility also like to inform the public about like what is working on alignment and what isn't and like where we are and where we do we think we can go. Um, but uh, yeah, in the end of end of the day, like also like governments will have to, a role to play on like how this all goes. Yeah, if Congress investigates all of this and it concludes that it's too it's uncom it's uncomfortably dangerous and they think that a bunch of this research needs to be stopped do you think that the ai labs would be willing to go along with that uh, as like this is what a more democratic a more legitimate uh, process has output and so uh, we, we, we should uh we should be good citizens and and slow down or or stop yeah i mean like look like AI companies have to follow the laws of the country they're in. Like there's that's how the that's how the this works. Um but like and I, I, like I think what's gonna happen is like we will have regulation of frontier AI technology and like people are trying to figure out how to do that and like, you know, um we should try to do it like you know, like most sensibly as possible. Um I think there is like the larger question of like how can you like like not just like you know have something that whole like works let's say in the united states or in the united kingdom but like worldwide like um if there is you know like ways to build ai that are actually really dangerous then that has to apply to everyone and not just you know specific countries and i think that's also like a key challenge it's also not a challenge i'm personally working on but yeah i yeah. i think you know we need to solve that and, and <laughs> i'm excited yeah. for anyone who's working on that problem yeah um i suppose I've, I've, I've made a point something that makes me a bit pessimistic is just that it seems like we don't just need to solve one thing we need to solve many things uh, and we kind of if we mess up maybe just one of them then that could be very bad <laughs> we don't just need to have a technical solution but we need to make sure it's deployed in the right place and everyone follows it and then even if that works then maybe you could get one of these structural problems where it, it's, it's being it's doing what we tell it to but it makes society worse <laughs> um yeah do, do you well, see it see it as the flip side of all of this like okay. You know, there's so much opportunity to shape the future of humanity right now that, <laughs> yeah. like, you know, you, like, the listener could be working on and, like, yeah. could have a lot of impact. And, like, yeah. um, I think there's just, like, 
Yeah, so much work to do. And like, there's a good chance we actually live at the most impactful time in human history that has ever existed and that will ever exist. Kind of wild, yeah. super wild. Could be the case. I don't know. Yeah. Okay, uh, back in March, you tweeted, uh, before we scramble to deeply integrate large language models everywhere in the economy, can we pause and think about whether it's wise to do so? This is quite immature technology and we don't understand how it works. If we're not careful, we're setting ourselves up for a lot of correlated failures. And uh, a couple of days after that, OpenAI opened up GPT-4 to be connected to various plugins through its, through its API. And <laughs> one listener was curious to hear more about what you meant by that and whether there might be a disagreement within OpenAI about how soon GPT-4 should be hooked up to the internet and integrated into, into other services. Yeah, I I realized that tweet was like somewhat ambiguous and like, you know, it was read in lots of different ways. Um, like fundamentally, like what plugins allows you to do is like nothing on top of that you couldn't do with the API, right? Like plugins doesn't really add anything like fundamentally new that people couldn't already do. And I think, um, you know, like OpenAI like is like very aware of like what can go wrong when you like hook up plugins to the system and like, you know, you have to have the sandbox, you have to be like careful, you have to like, you know, you know, when you let people spend money and like all of these questions, um, but like they're also like sitting right next to us and we talk to them about it and like, you know, they've been thinking about it, but you know, if given like how much excitement there was to just like try GPT-4 on all the things, what I really wanted to do also is like, look, this is not quite mature. Like the, the <laughs> system will fail. Don't connect it to all of the things yet. Like mm -hmm. don't, like, make sure there's, like, a failback system. Like, make sure you've really played with the model to understand its limitations. If you have the model write code, make sure you're, like, reading the code uh, and understanding it or, like, executing it in the sandbox because otherwise the system might break the system, like, where, like, wherever you're writing the code, it might break that system. And, like, just be careful, be wise, like, make sure you understand what you're doing here. Hmm. And not just, like, hook it up to everything and like, see how it yeah. goes. Like, <laughs> is, is there anything that people are using GPT-4 for where you feel like maybe it's premature and we, 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 we should slow down and do some more testing? I mean, probably. I don't, I don't know if I can give you, like, some good examples, but, like, I think that's generally the story with new technologies, right? Like, um, I'm fundamentally like a techno optimist and like I think we should use AI for all the things that it's good for and like to some extent we just spend you know an hour talking about how great it would be to use AI for alignment research which is my job so I'm like you know trying to replace myself at my job with AI um, but at the same time we also have to really understand the limitations of this technology and some of it is not obvious and like some of it is like not widely known and um you know, like, you have to, like, do that in order to re deploy it responsibly and, and, like, you know, integrate it responsibly, like, integrate it into, like, society in a way that is actually wise to do. Um, and I think, yeah, I, I think it's just, as always with new technologies, like, I think a lot of, like, you know, we'll try a lot of things. And I, I'm also, like, excited for people to try a lot of things. And that's why, you know, like, I think it's good that the OpenAI API exists and it lets lots of people use cutting edge language models for all kinds of things. But you want to be also careful when you're doing that. Yeah, I guess uh, on this topic of just plugging things into the internet, uh, uh, you know, many years ago, uh, people uh, talked a lot about that they kind of had this assumption that if we had <laughs> a, a, an intelligent system that what that was as capable as GPT-4, that probably we would, you know, keep it keep it in a lead contained box and wouldn't plug it up to the internet because we'd be would be worried about it. But it seems like the current culture is just that as soon as a model is made, it just gets deployed onto the internet right away. Um, it seems like it's some... Like I mean, that's plans, not quite yeah. right, right? No? Okay, oh, like, go on. Yeah. We had GPT-4 for like eight months before we actually like, you know, yeah. it was publicly available. And I, uh, we did like a lot of safety tests. Like tests, we like did a lot of red teaming. We like made a lot of progress on its alignment, uh, and we didn't just connect it to everything immediately. I think that's, okay, yeah. but like, I think what you're actually trying to say is like, 
you know, many years ago, people were arguing over like, oh, but if you make, you know, AGI, can't you just keep it in the box and then like it'll yeah. never break out and we'll never do anything bad. Like, and you're like, well, it seems like that ship has sailed <laughs> yeah. and, and now that like is, we're yeah. connecting it to everything. And that's like partially what I'm like trying to allude here is like, you know, we should be mindful when we do connect it. And just yeah. because GPT-4 is on the API doesn't mean that, you know, like every future model will be like immediately available for everything and everyone in every case right like yeah. this is kind of the difficult line that you have to walk where you're like you know you want to like empower everyone with ai or like as many people as possible um but at the same time you have to like also be mindful of mis misuse and you have to be mm -hmm. mindful of like you know the ways like like all the other things that you can could go wrong with the model like misalignment being one of them and so yeah. How do you balance that trade off? That's like one of the key questions. Yeah, it seems like um, uh, one way of breaking up would be you know uh, connected to the internet versus not. But uh, I feel like often uh, and people, I, I'm guilty of this as well. Uh, we're just we're thinking either it's kind of deployed on the internet and consumers are using it, or it's like safely in the lab and there's and there's no problem. But there's this intermediate. I mean, stage there can where, also be problems if you have it in a lab. Right? Well, that's what <laughs> that's I'm saying. So that, that, that's exactly <laughs> what I'm saying, and and I feel like sometimes people lose track of that. That you know, misuse is kind of an issue if it reaches uh, you know the broader public, but misalignment can be an issue yeah. if something is merely trained and is just being used inside uh, a company because it, you know it will be figuring out <laughs> how can it how could it end up having broader broader impacts. And I think yeah, but because we tend to like cluster all of these like risks or like tend to speak very broadly, uh, the fact that a model can be dangerous if it's simply trained, even if it's like never uh, hooked up to the internet, uh, is something that we really need to keep in mind. And, and I guess it sounds like That's an right. open AI, people will keep that in mind. And like, I mean, we have to, like safety reviews really need to start before you even start the training run, right? Like, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, Open, here's another question. OpenAI's decision to create and launch ChatGPT has probably sped up AI research because there's now a rush into the field as people were really impressed with it. But it has also prompted a flurry of concerns about safety and new efforts to do preparation ahead of time to see off possible threats. With the benefit of hindsight, do you think that move to release ChatGPT uh, increased or reduced um, AI extinction risk, all things considered? I think that's a really hard question. And I think, I don't know if we can really definitively answer this now. I think fundamentally it probably would have been better to wait with ChatGPT and release it a little bit later. I think also to some extent, like this whole thing was inevitable and like, you know, it, um, like, you know, at some point the public will have realized how good language models have gotten and in, you could also say it's been surprising that it went this long before it was that was the case. I was honestly really happy how much it has like shifted the conversation or like advanced the conversations around risks from AI, but also kind of like you know the real kind of like alignment work that has been happening on like you know we can actually make things so much better and we should do more of that. And I think both of these are really good. And like you can now argue over like, you know, what the timing should have been and like whether it would have happened anyways. I think it would have happened anyways. And like when people are asking these questions, which are really good questions to ask, which is like, well, can't we all just like stop doing AI if we wanted to? And like it feels so easy, right? Just like just stop. Just don't do it. Like yeah. wouldn't that be a good thing? And like but then also in practice, there's just like so many forces in the world that like keep this from going, like let's just keep this going, right? Like let's say OpenAI just decides, oh, we're not going to train a more capable model, but just not do it. OpenAI could do that. And then, you know, like there's a bunch of OpenAI competitors who like might still do it. And then, you know, you still have AI. Okay, let's get them on board. Like let's get the top five AGI labs or like that five tech companies that will train the biggest models and like get them to promise it. Okay, now you've promised them. Like they promised. Well, now there's going to be a new startup and there's going to be a tons of new startup and like and then you get into well, people are still making transistors smaller, so you'll just get more capable GPUs, which means the cost to like train a model that is more capable than any other model that has been trained so far, it still goes down exponentially year over year. And so now you're going to, you know, semiconductor companies and you're like okay can you guys chill out like 
and they're like fine like you know you can get them on board and then like you know now there's like upstream like companies who work on like uv lithography or something and they're like well we're working we've working on like making the next generation of chips and we've been working on this since the 90s and uh and then you get them to chill out and it's like it's a really complicated coordination problem that isn't just like okay can we and like you don't even it's not even that easy to figure out who else is like involved and so i'm personally you know, I think humanity can do a lot of things if it really wants to. And I think if like, you know, if if things actually get really, really scary, I think there's a lot of things that can happen. But also fundamentally, I think it's not an easy problem to solve. And I don't want to assume it's being solved. What I want to do is I want to ensure we can make as much alignment progress as possible in the time that we have. And then if we get more time, great. And then like maybe we'll need more time and then we'll figure out how to do that. Um, but what if we don't? I still want to be able to solve alignment. Like I don't want to I don't, I still want to win in the worlds where, you know, like we don't get extra time or like, you know, people just like for whatever reason, like things just move ahead. And like so however it goes, right? You could still come back to the question of like, how do we solve these technical qu qu questions as quickly as possible? And that's, I think, what, like, what we really need to do. Yeah, I suppose within this, uh, you know, I've seen online that there are people who are, you know, trying to slow things down basically to buy more time for for, for you and your team among among others. Uh, and there's, I mean, and there's some people who are taking out a really extreme view that they just want to stop progress on ai they just want to like completely stop it globally for some significant period of time um which seems as you're saying like a like a very heavy lift i, I imagine that i might uh, i guess I'm, I'm not sure but i think that their theory might be that at some point there'll be some disaster that changes attitudes in a really big way and then like things that currently just seem impossible might 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 become possible and so pe perhaps that their idea would make more sense then but i guess set it, setting that aside um is, in terms of the, the race to solve alignment it seems like uh we could either slow things down one percent or like get one percent more time or speed up alignment research by by one percent and the question might be like which of those two things is easier um it sounds like you think probably it's easier to speed up the alignment research or to like it's probably easier to to get alignment research going proceeding twice as quickly as it is to create to make timelines that are twice as long towards uh towards whenever we invent dangerous things yeah i think that's a really important point also like given like how few people are actually like working on alignment these days? Like you know, um, like it, yeah, what what is it? Is it hundreds, thousands? It depends on your account, right? Like yeah. the super alignment team is about twenty-ish people right now, but there's like a lot of other alignment efforts at OpenAI right now, right? Like if you count all of the RLHF work, it's probably more than a hundred. But if you go back two years, there's like three people doing RLHF or like five. Like I don't know. It's like it's ramped up a lot, but like yeah. we still need still so much tiny. more. And like <laughs> yeah. even like, you know, really talented individuals can still make such a big difference by switching to this, working on this problem now, just because it's still such a small field. It's still so much to do. There's like so much we still don't understand. And like in some ways, it feels like the real like final research frontier where like, look, we've figured out scaling. We know how to make the, more, like, the model smarter. Like you know, that, that is yeah, going to happen easy and boring. unless somebody like well, well, there's like some ways in which like you know people might stop it, but like we know how to do this. It's not <laughs> yeah. We, alignment is a real research problem. We're like we don't know how to align super intelligence. We want to figure this out. Like we have to. It's not optional. Yeah, yeah. The fact that the field is so small is exasperating on one level, but it's also uh, a reason for optimism in another sense because you could double it. Like if you could get a thousand ML researchers to switch into working on alignment, that would just so that, that would completely transform things, right? Exactly. Okay. Yeah. An another question. Um, Jan claimed that the super alignment team uh, wouldn't be avoiding alignment work that helps with commercialization, uh, but that that. But that work uh, in particular is already incentivized monetarily by definition. Uh, so why isn't he going to try to avoid that work, which will probably get done either way? I mean, I think this is like the whole point that a lot of people are trying to make is that like alignment wouldn't be done by default in the way that like, you know, um, we are really happy with or something. Or like, let's say, 
put differently, right? Like the problems that we want to solve are currently unsolved. And like, um, yes, some of it will be commercially valuable. And I think fundamentally, right? Like if you have two ways of building AGI and like one of them is just like much more aligned with humans, people will buy, want to buy the second one because it's just better for them. And uh, that will necessarily have commercial value and it, it'll be unavoidable. And I think in, in general, right? Like I think... A criticism that another like an adjacent criticism that has been raised in the past is like you know to a lot of people feel like RLHF has been like a capabilities progress because you know, like the RLHF models feel more capable you're like interacting with them they're more useful they're actually like you know um doing more things and like the reason is because they're trying to help you they're like more aligned they're like actually like you know leveraging their capabilities towards what you ever you're asking them to do versus like the pre-trained model isn't. And so it obviously feels a lot more capable because you've unlocked all of these capabilities. But if you then look at like what actually happens during fine training, right? Like um, the model isn't really learning fundamentally new skills it didn't have before, right? It doesn't like, I mean, you can do that through fine tuning theoretically, but not with the kind of compute budget that we use. Like for, for GPT-3, it was like, less than 2% of the pre-training compute. For GPT-4, it was even less than that. It's like really a tiny fraction. But at the same time, like, you know, because the model is now trying so much harder to be helpful, it is more helpful and it feels like, you know, you get all the capabilities that had been there in, in the first place. Mm. Um, and so to come back to the commercialization question, like, I think, so what I really want to do is solve the problem and if that is like commercially useful great if it's not like some of it will not be or like you know some of the research bets won't work out or like some of the things won't be useful before we actually get like you know really capable systems and that's fine but like the goal is to solve the problem that's what we want to do yeah uh another question uh open ai banking on there not being uh, a really fast takeoff uh, and uh, do they try to make plans that could also work in the event of a of a foom scenario that is like extremely rapid recursive self improvement of AI? Yeah, I think we should definitely plan. Like we should plan for that scenario and be ready if it happens. And to some extent, you know, like automated alignment research is probably like the best plan I know in that kind of scenario, where like you know you really have to scale up your alignment work in proportion with what's going on, and. I mean, like if you can do this by just like delegating almost all of the work to machines, then you know they can actually like keep pace with the machines because they're the only ones that can. Yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, I, I guess the concern would be if the if the intelligence explosion or if there is an intelligence explosion and it's very fast, then there's very little time for you to put your plans into into action and to and to keep up. Um, but that would be true of like, <laughs> it's just a very bad situation. Uh, it right. makes it very hard for any plan to work. Um, so that's right. And so, but what we should be doing, like, you know, if you just agnost, if you want to be agnostic to the speed of tech progress, which what we want to do here is like the best thing you can do is to prepare as much as possible ahead of time, which is why we need to start thinking now about how to align systems that we don't have yet. And the more you can prepare, the more you'll be ready for that scenario. Yeah. Okay. So, yeah, so, so a question I got was, um, uh, which 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 just slightly changes. Um, what are um, OpenAI's grounds for thinking alignment is solvable? Uh, and have they seen Dr. Uh, Roman Yampolsky's impossibility arguments against solvability? And and they linked to it to a, to a paper with, with with those arguments there. Um, I, I guess I I don't know exactly what those arguments are, but I know there are people out there who have kind of made theoretical arguments that alignment. You know that is impossible or extremely difficult uh, for, for 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 some conceptual reasons. Uh, are there any arguments along those lines that trouble you in particular, or or maybe do do you think that that kind of that kind of argumentation shouldn't be so persuasive? Yeah, I mean, I've looked at. I think I looked at the paper that you mentioned, and uh, I I think like any argument that I've seen, I haven't found particularly persuasive, and like. You know, the, the problem is like whenever you're trying to make a theoretical argument is like you need some kind of assumptions. And like, you know, the big question then really just becomes are these assumptions going to be true? Um, and 
like to me it just really seems like you know the jury is still out on this like it could turn out to be impossible it doesn't feel particularly likely to me but i don't have a proof for that but i will you know like we you know i think we're going to work really hard to find a counter example by like show, showing that it can be done i think it's definitely not the time to like give up i think we it's like very doable yeah i could feel the uh there's a bit of exasperation that comes through where you're like, all of these people complaining that this problem is insoluble, uh, like they're not helping. And like, clearly there are so many things we could try. Why don't we just try them? <laughs> they're helping in the sense that they're like indirectly doing recruiting for us where like, you know, <laughs> I see. Um, people like, because they're drawing attention to the problem. Yeah. And like, if you just went around saying the problem is easy, you wouldn't draw attention to it. People would be like, okay, it's fine. Then I don't Boring, have to worry yeah. about it. Yeah. But also like, I think that has also created a real energy of like, oh, it seems really hard, let's give up. And that's, I think, absolutely the wrong approach. Like, I think we should, if anything, that means we should try harder and like, you know, get more people to try to solve it. And like, you know, um, yeah, like to never give up, never surrender. Like this is all still, like the game is still up in the air. Like we should just really crush it. Okay, yeah, t two questions that were kind of pointing in the same direction uh, were, um, as OpenAI gets closer to AGI, do they plan to err on the side of paranoia in terms of giving AIs opportunities to manipulate um, staff or hack themselves out or otherwise have channels of causal influence? Uh, and another person asked, how much risk of human extinction are you willing to take in a large training run? Like, uh, for example, you know, to train GPT-5, 6 or 7 and, and so on. In general, they like, as the stakes get higher, we have a much higher burden of like you know proof of alignment proof of safety and like we've like, we've been ramping this up like over with like every system and like mm. the systems we have now it's still like aren't like catastrophically risky or like aren't close to that and so you know for example like gpt2 was just open source everyone can mm. download it and do whatever they want with it gpt3 was not and like you know you make it available via an api and then like gpt4 we like like uh the only like publicly available version is the like alignment fine-tuned version like the rlhf mm. version the chat gpt version um and, uh, you know, I think the the base model, as far as I know, is only like on researcher access. So it's not like, you know, we're, we're steering the public towards the RLHF model. And like, I think with, with each of these steps, you're like, you're also stepping up your safety. You're also stepping up your alignment. And, you know, that obviously that has to be the higher the like capability level, the like higher the stakes are and the like more mm -hmm. safety and like alignment measures you need. And yeah, so people can That's... kind of expect that trend to trend to continue. Um, yeah. yeah, on the same theme, uh, on, on Twitter, someone asked, uh, they asked you actually in a different thread, how would you define success? And you replied, the scientific community agrees that we've solved <laughs> that we've solved alignment. Yep. Um, and they, 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 they asked, uh, they said, this statement from Jan was good. <laughs> Is there a meaningful uh, related commitment that OpenAI could make, for example, to not deploy systems above a certain threshold of capability unless there is a broad scientific consensus that alignment has been solved for, for that kind of system, at least? At the end of the day, like, I think we're going to have to convince the scientific community because, you know, I don't think the world will let us build something that's catastrophically dangerous and, like, you know, the world is paying attention now. And I, I mean, think that's all good, right? Yeah, like, yeah. I mean, the crazy I thing think... is at the moment. So, okay. Uh, so so I, I've, I've learned recently that in the UK, if you want to rent out a house to more than three unrelated people, then you need a special license in order to do that. But as far as I can tell, at least currently, one doesn't need a license or any sort of approval in order to train an AGI. Um, I suppose that's partly because we probably can't do that yet. Um, but, I, I mean, it does seem like currently there aren't that many legal restrictions and we're just kind of we're, we're hoping that there will be <laughs> pretty pretty quickly or at least uh, I'm, I'm 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 hoping that there'll be more infrastructure in place to yeah yeah i mean that seems right to me and like you know regul like people are working on regulation and like this is something that like regulation has to solve and like there's a lot of questions around this that i'm not an expert in yeah. um but to come back to the scientific like so how how do you define success question right like um I think, you know, it's, it, I definitely like, I feel very strong. It's like not sufficient to just convince ourselves that we did a good job because it's like so easy to convince yourself that you did a good job at something that you like care a lot about. But like, we, 
actually have to like convince an ex external experts. We have to like convince external auditors who are like looking exactly at what we're doing and like why and like all of the like. I think we'll just actually have a mountain of empirical evidence of like here's all the things we tried. Here's like you know what what happens when we do. Here's like you know you can look at the data. You can look at the code. And then people can scrutinize what we're doing. And I think that's like, you know, like because the stakes will end up being so high, correspondingly, right? Like we also have to invite a lot of scrutiny in what we're doing. And like one aspect of it that we kind of started with now is like we want to say what we're trying, like what we're planning to do. Like what what are what is our like, you know, overall approach to aligning the systems that we're building. And we want to invite, like, you know, feedback and criticism. Like, maybe there's something, like, way better that we could be doing. I would love to know that. And then we would do that instead. And, um, you know, like, I think in general, like, I think the public should just know what, yeah, what we're doing on alignment and, like, make independent judgments on whether that would be enough. And, like, I think, you know, experts will have to, like, a role to play in this because you know, their knowledge will be required to make it like informed conclusions from this. Yeah. Um, I think, yeah, an interesting th uh, thread with um, the, the the audience questions is uh, so so many of them about policy and governance. Um, and th those are also the kinds of questions that I'm more tempted to ask because I often don't understand the technical details. And I imagine many people on Twitter don't know enough to scrutinize the, the technical the technical proposals. So we're more thinking about, you know, at a social level, as an organizational yeah. level, are, are things set up well? Um, right. But, which, and I feel like my answer is often just like, yeah, I would love to see more of that. Like, yeah, please yeah. solve no, this problem. Exactly. It's like, well, I'm not working on this, but here's yeah, well, how what I'm <laughs> working on helps. Like, hopefully. Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> that's why I feel it's uh, it's. I mean, I mean, it's it's reasonable to put these questions to you and and to find out what what you think. But uh, yeah, there's just a lot of people who need to take action, and you got to keep your head down, focused on this technical stuff because that's your specialty. But we also need the governance people at OpenAI to be putting in place the good uh, good structures, and we need the Senate committee on this to be figuring out what what uh, to, play, yep. to be playing their role. And it's just uh, yeah, um, there's a lot of different pieces that that that, that have to slot together. That's right. Okay. So that's that's been a whole lot of of audience questions, uh, but we're we're heading towards the, the the final final half hour or so of the conversation. And I guess my my dream is that this interview can help get you lots of great applications to work on the on on the super alignment team. Um, yeah, ideally, would move a whole lot of people from work that's interesting, oh, but not be that my uh, my dream too. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I'm glad I'm glad we're really aligned. Um, yeah, hopefully we get some people moving from stuff that's kind of interesting but not that helpful to something that is both super intellectually interesting and. Uh, and, and also might save the world in some sense. Um, I guess I don't want to take a strong contrarian view on uh, like whether this the super alignment project is, is is better or worse than other projects that um, people who are really m much more technically informed than me uh, think think are plausible. But it seems like the the, the, uh, the plan that you've laid out seems as good to me as any other plan that I've heard. And it seems like you've got the the resourcing and situation to to make a real go of it. Um, and I guess also if the plan doesn't doesn't uh, doesn't bear as much fruit as you hope in the next couple of years, I imagine you'll be able to pivot to pivot to a different plan. So yeah, what what roles are you hiring for, and in, in what sort of numbers? So lay it all out. Yeah, um, we are primarily hiring for research engineers, research scientists, and research managers. Um, and I expect there'll be like, like we'll be continuing to hire like a lot of people. We'll probably be, like at least ten before the end of the year is my guess. Um, and then like you know, maybe even more in the like years after that. Um, yeah. So what is all of these like? You know what? What do you like research engineers, research scientists, research managers? What what do they? What do these roles look like? So, in a way, we don't actually make a strong distinction between research engineer and research scientist at OpenAI. And like, whether like, you know, in each of these roles, you're like expected to write code, you're expected to run your own experiments. And in fact, I think it's really important to like always be running lots of experiments, like small experiments, testing your ideas quickly, uh, and then like, you know, iterating and like trying to learn more about the world. Um, and uh, in general, like you don't, there's no PhD required for like, also for the research scientist roles. Um, and really the only, you don't even have to like have worked in alignment before. And in fact, like, you know, it might be good if you didn't because 
um, you'll have a new perspective on the problems that we're trying to solve. What we generally love for people to bring though is like a good understanding of how the technology works, right? Like you, you understand language models, you understand like reinforcement learning, for example, you can like build and implement like you know, ML experiments and debug them. Um, and then on like, you know, the research scientist, more research scientist end of the spectrum, I think you would be expected a lot more to like think about like what experiments to do next or like, you know, how like come up with ideas of like how can we like address the problems that we're trying to solve or like, you know, what is what are, like some other th problems that we aren't thinking about that maybe we, we should be thinking about, right? Or, you know, like how should we design the experiments that we like will like let us learn more and then on the research engineering spectrum um uh, there's a lot of kind of like you know let's just actually build the things that let us run these things and like let's you know make the progress that we already know like if we have a bunch of good ideas that will not be enough right like we actually have to then test them and build them and like you know actually ship something that other people can use and that involves writing a lot of code and that involves like you know debugging ml and like run like you know like you know, running lots of sweeps of experiments, like getting big training runs on like, you know, GPT-4 and other big models set up. And so I think in practice, actually most people on the team like kind of move somewhere on the spectrum and like, you know, some sometimes there's like more coding because we kind of know what to do. And sometimes there's more researchy because we don't know yet know what to do. And we like kind of like starting a new project. Um, but uh, yeah, in general, like I think, you know, you'll have to just, you, know, you need a lot of like critical thinking and like, you know, um, asking important questions and like, you know, getting, being very curious about the world or like, you know, and the technology that we're building. And for the research manager, basically that's a role where like you're like managing like a small or medium sized or large, even large team of research engineer and research scientists towards a specific goal. And so, there you're like, you, you should be like setting the direction of like, you know, what are the next milestones? Where should we go? Like, how can we like make this way question of like, you know, we want to understand this type of generalization or like we want to, you know, like we want to uh, like make a data set for like automated alignment research or something like that, right? Like you have to break it down and like make it more concrete and like figure out what people can be doing. But also like, you know, there's a lot of just like day-to-day -day management of like, how do you, um, how can we like make people motivated and, and productive, but also like um, make sure they can work together and like just, you know, traditional management stuff. Yeah, yeah. Um, okay, so it sounded like the, the, the main, well, for the first two, the main thing was that you had a good understanding of current ML technology. You could actually run, ex you would be able to go in and potentially think up experiments and, and, and run experiments. Um, are there any kind of other, I, other kind of concrete skills that you require or like what, what would be the typical background of someone who you would be really excited to get an application from? Um, there's a lot of different backgrounds that are applicable here. I think like, um, I mean like machine learning PhDs have been like the traditional like way people get into the field, especially because like, you know, if you want to do something more researchy, I don't think you need that like at all. And in fact, if you're thinking about starting a PhD now, uh, I don't know if you'll have that much time. Like, you should just go work on the problem now. Um, I think for, like, um, research engineers, I think the kind of background is, like, you know, maybe you've worked in a STEM field and you're like, okay, I'm going to, you know, stop doing that. I'm going to take six months and just re-implement a bunch of ML papers and, like, learn a bunch that way. Um, or, you know, like, somebody who, like, works at a tech company doing, like, other machine learning, engineering related things, and now wants to split to, to alignment. I think that's like a really good profile. Um, or, uh, and like, I also wanna like stress this like, you know, most people we are trying to hire haven't worked in alignment before, just because like the people who have been working on alignment before, like there's so few of them. And also I think the core expertise that you will need is like, you know, machine learning, skills and like there's a, a bunch of things you you know you should know about alignment but you can also learn them when you once you hear um yeah or you can like catch up along the way and i think that's fine and on the research manager role 
Uh, are you? I guess you're looking for somewhat different skills there that someone might have more management experience. Uh, and I mean, yeah, being a good researcher and being a good manager are not the same thing. <laughs> These things absolutely can come apart. So I guess would you be looking for a particular kind of person for the for the manager role? Yeah, and like I think. I mean, they can be anti-correlated, which uh, is <laughs> I think unfortunate. They, I think they might be sometimes, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but um, I, I think, like, ideally you would have managed before. And, like, I think there's different, like, ways it could go, right? Like, there's scenarios where, you know, you split up, split up your responsibilities between a research, like, a tech or a research lead and a manager. Hmm. And, like... You know, the manager takes on more of the responsibilities of management and the tech lead t is like more of setting the direction for the team and like, you know, giving like making sure the technical stuff is like what happening that needs to happen. Um, but like in that configuration, like they have to get along really well and they like, you know, have to like, you know, really be on the same page to like effectively divide these responsibilities. And in particular, I think the manager still ha should have like a really detailed understanding about what we're trying to do um but ideally we'd want to have someone who just can do both roles in one and so the kind of background would be like um i don't know like you you've like led a research team at some other company or like you know in some kind of other branch of machine learning or you know like you've you've been a manager before in like some other domain and then you like switch to being an ic uh, on, or I, I see means individual contributor on like, you know, some kind of like large language model project, say. Um, or there's also like a path where like, you know, maybe you're, you're like a, a postdoc somewhere and like you have like a, a small research team that you're like working with day to day and like it's very coding heavy and like you're running lots of experiments with like language models or like reinforcement learning or something like that. I think, you know, these are all possible profiles, but like it's kind of you know hard to know what exactly. Like I think the the bigger filter is just more like you know you should actually really care about like the problems that we're trying to solve, and like you need to be like really good at coding. You need to be really good at machine learning, and like um, yeah, yeah. Uh, as I understand it, uh, one of the impressive and difficult things that OpenAI has had to work on is just getting the chips and getting the compute to work well and and, and efficiently. I mean, I think these are these are these are enormous uh, aggregations of compute, and it's not like the engineering of getting that to work is 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 not at all straightforward. And I guess we're getting it to work for ML purposes specifically. That that adds its own complications. Are you hiring people to do that that engineering side of things? Um, OpenAI definitely is, and uh, um, yeah, I think like mostly on the like super alignment team what we'll be dealing with is more like being consumer on of the like you know infrastructure that like runs these large scale experiments yeah. and so in particular people on super alignment need to be comfortable debugging like these like large distributed systems right because if you're doing a fine tuning jam run on gpd4 it is such a system it's not easy to debug but we don't have to build like the large language model infrastructure because it From already scratch, exists yeah. and other already people are, are like working on that. Yeah. Um, what, what does the application process look like? Yeah, so um, it's very simple. You go on openei.com slash careers and you scroll down and you'll find the like roles that have super alignment in the title and you click on it and then you submit your CV and say why you want to work on this. And then that's it. And then we'll see it. <laughs> well, okay. Uh, is uh, is there any further <laughs> steps to the process? And so yeah. So, um, like the general interview process that we follow is like you know we're like, um, there's like a tech screening and there's like you know an intro chat with uh, someone from the team and there's like you know an on-site process where I think there's like. Uh, two to four coding interview, like or coding or ML interviews, and like you know a culture fit interview, mm. uh, or like um, but like depending on the job or like the you know background, like it might look slightly differently. Yeah, uh, are you kind of expecting to, you know, maybe hire twenty people and then only keep ten of them in in the long run, or is it more uh you're like gonna tr gonna try to hire people who who mostly you you, you expect to work out. Yeah, I mean, 
yeah we want to like really like invest in like the researchers that we're hiring and so okay, yes so it's more more, um, more of the second one yeah is there a way i mean i imagine uh the bar is reasonably high for for, for getting hired is, is um there a way of communicating like what what, what the bar kind of is i i, I know uh so people could be both overconfident and underconfident, uh, and it could be quite bad if someone would be really good, but they uh, they don't they don't feel uh, like they're, like they're such a badass that they should necessarily get a, get a role like this. So it's, uh, if, there, if there's any kind of more explicit um, way of communicating who should apply, uh, that that could be useful. Yeah, I think I I mean maybe the most important thing is like if you're in doubt, like please apply. Like uh, it's not you know. Yeah. Yeah, but like the, we would. The, the cost of a false negative is much higher than the cost of a false positive. Exactly, exactly. Yeah. You've slightly already done this earlier in the interview, but uh, yeah, do you want to just directly make the pitch for why amazing people should apply to to work with you on the on the super alignment team? Yeah, I think. I mean, in short, it's like I think this is like like one of the most important problems. Like we really have to get this right. It's not optional. Like we want to do really ambitious things, right? Like we've set ourselves the goal to like actually solve it in four years like we're serious about that so if you want to work in like uh like in a team of like like highly motivated talented people who are like really trying to solve uh like ambitious problems and like have a lot of resources to do so this is the place to go i think also like you know we are like we are at the state of the art of the technology and like we you know we like OpenAI is really backing us at what we want to do. So like I think we have uh, as good as of a shot at the problem as anyone else, if not more. And I think we should just really do it and like really go for it. And like you could you could like make that happen, and that would be really exciting. Do you also need any um non machine learning and non non research people on that team? There's always a first operations communications legal these other groups uh, or they they're, they're maybe for that you'll just have to apply to open ai um in, in general rather than the alignment team specifically yeah that's right and i'm i'm generally like also just really excited to have more people who really care about the alignment problem who can really care about the future of ai go well just apply to open ai like whatever role just like you know help us make that future a reality and like i think you know like and there's a lot of people at OpenAI who really care about this, but like just more people who care about the problems, the important problems, I think like, the better. Yeah. So many policy issues have come up through the conversation. I know, that, I know there are some really amazing people on the policy team uh, over, over at uh, OpenAI. That's right. Um, oh, yeah. I can give like, yeah, I, I can name some other teams. So I think they're like, you know, AI governance or like policy research team is doing really excellent work on like, you know, dangerous capabilities evaluations and like, uh, like actually like trying to get agreements about like when should we all stop and like uh, and like there's uh, the system safety team that like actually tries to improve uh, like alignment and safety of models we have right now or, like making the refusals better fixing jailbreaking improving monitoring all of these problems are really important and like um, you know like for some readers who, uh, for some listeners who like might be like more skeptical about like you know the long run problems that we have we have to solve and like want to like do something that has impact right now these are great teams to join and i'm excited for what they're doing um and then of course there's like a lot of other teams at open that are doing important work like you know just improving rlhf improving uh chat gpt um, like you know, all of this like legal, you know, communications, recruiting. There's a lot of lot of things to do. We are like focusing on like trying to figure out how to align super intelligence. But as we've discussed, yeah. it's not the only thing we need. Yeah, yeah. If someone were reluctant to apply because they were scared that getting involved might in enhance capabilities, and they were someone who thought that speeding up capabilities research was a what was a bad thing. Um, yeah. What what would you say to them? I mean, if you if you don't want to do that don't apply the capabilities team <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah fair enough yeah yeah so i yeah. think i mean i think in I general it's, like it's the, the obvious thing is it sounds like working on the super alignment team is not going to meaningfully contribute to uh capabilities progress on, on any kind of global level i mean i don't want to like promise that nothing will do will have any capabilities impact and i think like as as we like mentioned earlier i think some of the biggest alignment will wins will also have some of these effects and i think that's just real and unavoidable um i think also like 
uh, I think in the EA community specifically, there's a lot of hesitation around like, oh, if I get into ML or like if I do like an ML engineering job somewhere, I might accelerate timelines a little bit and it will be so bad if I did that. And I think like, you know, that kind of reasoning really underestimates like the uh, career capital growth and the skills growth that you would get by just like doing some of these jobs for a while while you're skilling up and then you know you can switch to alignment later and i think in general like there's so many people working on capabilities that like you know one more or less will make it go that much faster um but like there's not that many people in alignment so like as one person working on an alignment you can actually like make a much larger difference yeah uh yeah, as as uh, as we always do uh, when when this topic comes up, I'll, I'll link to our article. Uh, if you want to reduce AI risk, should you take roles that advance AI capabilities? Uh, and there we um, have responses from uh, a wide range of people who we who we ask this question to, uh, who do have something of a range of views. But I think I think the reasoning that you've given out there that. Uh, just your proportional increase in capabilities research that you would make would be very small relative to the proportional increase in alignment uh, research that you would make. Uh, pl plus all of the uh, benefits that you get from skilling up personally and then being able to use those skills later in your career. Uh, it seems uh, it seems pretty 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 clear to me in, in, in this case at least. Um, what are the distinctive things about OpenAI's culture that people should be aware of going in? Uh, is there a particular kind of character that really, that really thrives there? I mean, I think like we generally like want to be like really welcoming to like all kinds of different people and all kinds of different characters and like you know everyone like the more like i think we just need a lot of diversity of thought like how to go about this problem and like um you know other like many people have said this before like there's also like so many non-machine learning aspects to this problem mm. and so like if, especially if you somebody has like a non-traditional background and like switched into ML or like like has specifically like origin story that is like non-typical I think that's super valuable I think in general like I I care a lot about like having a team culture that is like like really warm and friendly and like you know inclusive but also like creates a lot of psychological safety for like people to voice spicy takes on like some of the things that we're doing and like or you know our approach in general and like, we need to collaborate to solve the problem and it's not just like a, you know um like who can get the credit or something like this problem just needs to get solved yeah um if a really talented person wanted to switch into working on technical alignment, but uh, for some reason uh, it was impossible for them to go join you on the super alignment team, uh, is there anywhere else that you'd be really excited for them to to apply? Yeah, uh, I, I mean, I think I'm thinking not at OpenAI. <laughs> yeah, I, I think there's like other like AI labs that I I think are doing a good job, like like really really a uh, cool work, like you know. Google DeepMind or Anthropic or like, and there's like other like academic labs that are really doing cool stuff like, you know, uh, at Berkeley or at Stanford or like, you know, in Oxford and like, you know, uh, I, I think I would consider applying to those. I think also just like, you know, like I, it's always very sad when we like have to turn down really talented people. Um, but also like we are a small team, we can't hire everyone and like, um, you know, if sometimes like people aren't quite ready and like, you know, it's good to focus on more like skill building and career capital investment. And I think that's also a really valid strategy. And I think all in all, like probably people are like, you know, people that go through a pipeline generally underestimate how valuable it is to, you know, take a research engineering job at another company and like skill up and like learn a bunch of things. And then, um, there's a lot of opportunities to do that. Yeah. Just on practical questions, is it is it possible to work remotely? Uh, and, and can you sponsor visas for people who aren't US citizens? Yes, we definitely sponsor visas. Um, we generally, I mean, remote work is uh, generally not encouraged because like, like almost the entire team is in San Francisco. We like go in, into the office at least three times a week. And there's it's just so much easier to collaborate. And so yeah. like if you can do that, that's like that would be really good. Yeah. 
yeah are there any other points that you that you want to make before we before we push on yeah thank you so much for like you know letting me pitch these roles here i uh, i'm like yeah i i'm really excited for like yeah more people who like really care about this problem really care about the future to go well and like making sure like humanity goes like manages this transition into a post AGI world yeah um and yeah i'm thank you for doing this <laughs> All right, uh, we've already got overtime, and I've, yeah, I've, I've been uh, keeping you for a long while, and I'm sure you have a lot of stuff to do setting up, <laughs> setting up this this whole project. Maybe a final question before we go is, yeah, do you have a uh, favorite piece of piece of science fiction? Um, I mean, I I really like the Greg Ergen books. Um, yeah. If you, uh, I mean, like a lot of these are like really old. Like Permutation City was like one of my like favorites, and like a lot of the ideas that like he plays with are like like felt really out there at the time i'm sure but like now it just seems so much striking a lot closer to home in a whole bunch of ways and you can kind of feel more and more of like the weird sci-fi ideas become reality but also like um i actually like that like you know he tries to like paint a positive view of like what society like could look like in in the long run yeah um, uh, well I, I was uh, whatever you said i was going to ask um is your life weirder or less weird than than what is portrayed in that piece of science fiction i actually don't know what uh, I, I don't i don't know about permutation city but maybe maybe you can could, could you quickly tell us what it's about and uh, whether it's whether it's weirder than your own <laughs> situation in this world it's like uh definitely less weird definitely it's so much more weird than my life oh, okay uh, yeah so permutation city is like a book that plays with the like idea of uploading of like having digital copies of humans and like living in like in a mathematical universe and like you know what is um well like the implementation like implications on that and like you know if like you know virtual humans can like rewrite their own code and like a lot of things like that that we like we can't do yet and like maybe like in some ways we can like ai can do it because like or maybe in the near future or medium future AI could like rewrite parts of its own new network or something if we like make interpretability progress but um yeah i mean like i don't know <laughs> it's like very out there fic science fiction right that's yeah. what makes it so cool yeah yeah um i i do feel i do feel like uh I don't know. I do feel like sometimes we're living through a science fiction. <laughs> yeah. um, oh, this is like, nothing. It's going to get so much okay. weirder. Okay. Yeah. All right. <laughs> well, we we have that to look forward to in the in the 2030s or tw tw yeah. tw 2040s. Um, I, don't, I don't know exactly how it's going to go, but I promise you it'll be weird by today's standards. Yeah. Well, uh, yeah. yeah. Best of best of luck with the project. I, I really look forward to to seeing how it how it comes along. Uh, my guest today has been Jan Leiker. Uh, thanks so much for coming on the 80,000 Hours podcast, Jan. Thank you so much for having me.